Hey, Julie. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. How's it going? Pretty, pretty good. Hi, Tom. Jay. John. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hey, Jay. We missed you the last meeting. Hey, Jay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sure you guys accomplished a ton without me. So probably more. We signed you up for a whole bunch of activities. <laughs> because you couldn't say no. <laughs> all right, I'll start handing out flyers. <laughs> I, I already did that. You're, you're all covered on that. I, you I, know, are, I, I appreciate you, that. You were nominated to distribute the parking garage RFP, the final RFP, to be specific. Thank you. All right. Happy to do it. Hey, Dan. Hey, Liz. Hey there. Hi, Liz. Hello. Um, Julie and Andrew, how late did CPDC go last night? Uh, too late. One thirty, one thirty something, and I learned the hard way that the town hall has an alarm system. Oh no! Oh. Recently installed. It's not like something I just haven't known for six years. It's a brand new system and it goes off. It's it's a, it's uh activated at one in the morning and I set it off when I left because I didn't know. Uh, a chain of emails this morning. <laughs> three cruisers came and I, I had to scrape my car off too because it was snowing. So uh, it was fun. That's too bad. They are very responsive uh, to alarms. I know from experience. I've had a few false alarms at my store, so. The police are very, in fact, there's Deputy Chief Amendola. So we will just commend your team on their rapid response to alarms. Oh, <laughs> I, that was a good way for me to say how hard Julie works and the staff over at Town Hall and how late. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Well, that seems like uh, for poor Julie and Andrew, and I know others of us were on, I, I didn't, didn't stay on the call past 11 something because I, couldn't, but uh, thanks for everybody for staying up late for that. And let's try to keep this meeting efficient so people don't lose their minds. We did make a lot of progress, so that was good. <clears throat> Excellent. That is for sure. Yeah, it looked like the, there was a some pretty productive discussion going on, which was encouraging. Anyway, did um, do we have our just trying to get a, looks like we have a uh, quorum looks here. Like, yeah. yeah, I think everybody. we have everybody's in attendance. <clears throat> Terrific. Mm -hmm. And um, let me just see if I can, do we have any, I don't see anybody from the um, public logged in. Is that right? Except maybe, yeah. Deputy Chief is on, so that's useful. To... All right, so maybe we should get started. Um, I've been through uh, not the entire minutes. Does anybody, I have a couple of things at the beginning where um, there were some yellow marks for. Yeah. Uh, I just went through tonight and rewatched the beginning portion of the video to update some of these numbers, correct them. Um, I hope they match yours. If you found differently, just let me know. Yeah, I think I had 15 out of, uh, th sorry, 15 out of, um, sorry, 31 owners out of 50 responded to his 
I so think 31. he said he pulled 31 and 31 out of 50, but 15 out of that 31 response. That's what I remember. I got a I got a spreadsheet. I mean, I have a I have a spreadsheet that that um, imported his that imported his um, email, and it you know it details owners one through thirty. Um, I don't know why I have thirty one, but it, but yeah, he he heard from 30, 30 out of fifty owners. I think that's the way it was. 30 out of 50 owners who responded to an email indicated that they owned a combined 38 uh, parking spaces. So they that 30 people owned 38 spaces and had 52 cars um, with upcoming needs for an additional three cars for a total need of 55 cars. <clears throat> and I think, uh, Um, I can't see the 38 parking, so they indicated they own a combined 38 parking spots and had 52 cars. And then after the 52 cars with an additional, no, with upcoming needs, for an additional three cars for a total need of 55 cars. That extends the... And then on the uh, ratio um, shows a need in a couple of shows a need for 1.83 spaces per unit. Thank you. I think that's all I had there. Um, anybody else? I'm fine with mine, Bernie. Is it possible to give me like a 15 to 30 second overview of the meeting? Um, or is that kind of impossible? Uh, 15 to 30 seconds might be a little hard. <laughs> the, the minutes are, the minutes I think are pretty good. Did you get a chance to read through the minutes? No, I did not. Yeah, maybe you should just read through that when you have a chance and then you can probably, um, but uh, briefly, Jay, we, we went um, line by line through the spreadsheet and sort of came to consensus about parking regs for each street. And also we spent a lot of time focusing on employee parking and um, as a, a focal point that we need to finalize some things. And then also we were talking about the kiosks and some data that Julie had collected um, from other towns. So those were the, the highlight areas. Thank you, Liz. I really appreciate that. There were also a lot of people that attended the meeting from, um, I think a lot of emails were given to us prior about the complaints about overnight parking and where should they park and- Oh big, yeah, overnight parking. Yeah. yeah, overnight parking and the um, need for the postmark needs more spaces. And so um, a lot of people brought up their concerns about all that. So that was a large public comment period actually. Yeah, we, we had either letters or people from three medical practices, Dowd Medical, the foot and ankle specialists, and the, I think it was the, the pediatric dentist. They, they were all saying they needed something like 20 to 30 spaces. 
and they were um, sort of trying to find out from Park where that was going to come from. Thank you very much for sharing it, Sarah. Appreciate that. Yeah. And the Linden Street um, contingent had requested less, oh, yeah. um, less uh, basically no regulation on their street. <clears throat> and I think we, um, but in summary, we, we did do a pretty good job of um, going through, I think all the streets mm -hmm. And that document is what Andrew sent out today or um, the other day. I think there was an updated one today with the color coding on it, which I've not yet opened. But that uh, really, you know, summarizes all the changes we made, which I think were pretty. I think I was trying to pull up Street View at the time or something and just missed it. Yeah, I know, I recall the discussion. I just can't recall the sequence of uh, questions. No worries. Yeah. Um, so do we have a motion to uh, move those subject to um, um, a correction on that item? Not, um, anybody have any other corrections to the minutes? No, I'm, I'm good. I have to. I have to step away for five minutes. I'll. I'll be right back. Okay. I, I vote yes on this. Okay. Well, do we have a, a motion and a second? So, so, so Karen, was that a motion? A yeah, motion to accept the minutes. Okay. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> so noted. Thank um, you. And then, um, so just as a double check, do we have anybody from the public that might want to make any comments? Okay, if not, um, Andrew, would you like to take us through the uh, revised color coded sure thing um i can bring up the color coded one i wasn't going to go through that one on the screen um but they're really the same besides the color um let me find that one quickly all right so in summary, yes, we did a good job of getting through a lot of this spreadsheet and a lot of the street by street um, regulations and some of the proposed changes. Um, just to briefly summarize some of them, north of the tracks, we, uh, outer core, we did allow for some additional employee parking. Um, that came at an estimated of a 63 spots being added to the employee parking program, um, give or take a few spots. I was trying to combine some numbers on the maps and the street views and the engineering estimates. So it's a rough estimate, but it should be pretty close to real time. Um, so based on some of the changes to Shoot Street, Haven Street, Chapin Ave, Lowell and Woburn, um, we ended up getting that additional 63 employee spaces, which is great. A lot of the unregulated areas park elected to keep the same for the time being. Um, and then south of the tracks, we really had no changes. So I will say um, in the last two weeks, uh, Deputy Chief Amendola did look into the Arlington Street and Washington Street, uh, or sorry, yes, Washington and Arlington Street, and where we had last stated it was no parking on both sides. It's no parking on one side and no parking from 6 to 1030 on the other. So if Park did want to potentially open those up to residents in the morning, you can rehash that discussion if you wish or we can leave it the same. Sorry if that was not a super clear explanation. 
Yeah, sorry, my map was wrong that evening. Um, it doesn't happen often, but I went back and checked and checked it to the traffic rules. So you guys are right. I assume you're probably right in why it's like that. Those residents probably asked for it to stay like that and they, they got it. Um, so one of them, I believe Arlington has no parking on one side and also the, the regulation from 6 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. on one side. Washington Street, however, has parking on both sides and um, the PTTF is actually going to be looking at that tomorrow to see if we should be allowing parking on both sides because it's a narrow road. So if you guys do want to look at changing that 6 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. rule on one side of each street, that's wide open to you. So I apologize for the confusion. Okay. Um, so you can take time to think about that with everything. <laughs> um, inner core we got through as well, where we really, there weren't a lot of changes on the inner core outside of Gould Street, which was just reducing some, taking away some of the all day employee spaces and converting them to only two hour for turnover and public use. That was around 15 spaces. Um, Park elected again to keep a lot of the resident only spaces and then in the lots themselves um, we had discussed kiosks which we'll do again later tonight Julia has some updated information and here's where we kind of left it off was the regulations themselves and you know I don't know if we want to get too into pricing I don't know if that is park or not, but some of the regulation changes that park was considering was right now the resident only is 6 to 10 30 a.m. and park was considering that to change that to 9 30 to open up those spaces. There seemed to be earlier, there seemed to be some consensus around that, but please let me know if that's different. Um, employee parking. The question kind of remaining open is if you want to keep the regulation that allows residents who front employee parking areas to receive free employee parking permits because they front that regulation. Um, and that same regulation exists for resident only, which might make more sense. When it comes to enforcement, right now regulations are enforced Monday through Friday. Park, I think, was originally thinking, what if it was Saturday, Monday through Saturday, though I'm not quite sure how the police enforcement schedule works. And I think a lot of the regulations currently are strictly Monday through Friday. And then also all of the supply is unregulated after 5 p.m. And I was just thinking, so would that remain in lots if they were kiosked um, after 5 p.m.? Would lots be considered free or not? Um, and then obviously overnight parking. Um, I'd love to lob out two thoughts um, relating to all of these. Um, one, since we have Deputy Chief Amendola on the on the line here, knowing that <clears throat> all of those medical um, institutions are struggling right now in our current situation, until we get a you know actual decisions and regulations on on the books. Would it be reasonable for, to recommend that they park um, on the, in the high street, formerly leased spaces, and that your current enforcement professionals maybe just turn a blind eye to that area for now? <laughs> um, we would really, yeah, I mean, we would really need the select board to tell us or to stop enforcing the passes, especially where some people have already paid for them, some haven't. Um, you know, it's just really open to, I don't know whatever everybody wants to do because I get it. They're looking at an empty train station, but will it be empty forever? So, um, oh, I didn't even mean the train station. I meant like oh, further, 
further down. Right. But uh, I, well, I call that all the, sorry, the resident sticker parking. Is that what you're talking about? The, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking the, yeah, the the ones past down, past down, but down medical. Right. And we, use. you know, we would suggest too, like down Vine Street is wide open, but uh, the chief won't do it until the select board would tell him to stop. Gotcha. Okay. I was just thinking to ease, ease the complaints there in the, in the interim. Yeah. I mean, if the select board was happy to say, you know, just let them have it right now and we'll but not put it on the books we can do that and then still decide on the forward traffic <clears throat> rules forever but gotcha. i think you would just want to hear it from somebody one, one question relating to this um is it sounds like we've added do, do we have a count of the prior employee spaces and i think you said we added was it 63 andrew mm -hmm. And do we do we know then what the total employee is going to be as proposed? And if and do we have any? I don't know that we have any kind of a account of the number of employees that do work downtown. Must be a difficult figure to obtain. But I'm just curious if we have a. Um, in the past, we did share the total counts. I can try to find them quickly and pull them up on the screen, but it'll take me a minute or two. Okay. And of course, I guess this, um, you know, the unregulated, you know, is certainly wide open as well for employees. I guess we have to keep that in mind. And then if any of the employees are residents and they have a residence sticker, then, then there's, that opens up even more spaces for them. So I think we made pretty good progress in, uh, addressing this one of the probably main top two or three items that we've been talking to, talking about since we started. Although I will say subject to what totals Andrew comes up with, um, I do want to revisit the point that John made uh, towards the end of our last meeting that um, while we do believe that someday people may go back to commuting at the same levels that they used to, it has been two years now of a largely empty commuter rail parking lot. And so we really might want to add some more employee parking into some of those in the meantime, since that lower, it. lower area just, seems to be where we have the larger problem with all those medical practices. Right. And let me just understand. So after 930 though, anybody can park in those, those spaces anyway, right? Yes. But again, the the people down in Lower Haven Street are the medical practices who tend to get there at seven and who actually probably have a higher proportion of non-resident employees than many of the other businesses in town. Right. So yeah, so we do have all those. That's why I was trying to get it. If, if we have those um, formerly leased spaces, there are some 40, 40 or so of those spaces. Yeah, I think it was 41 or something like that. Yeah, so if I recall, the orthodontist had about 30 employees and then I don't know about uh, Dr. Dowd, I think there were maybe 20 or so, but it would seem that they would be accommodated entirely by those leased spaces, plus there's all that other employee parking that we're making available around there. So it seems like we're addressing their needs pretty extensively. And then if they do have maybe some of their office admin people come in after 930, I don't know, but. Uh, John, do you think that you could Hi, what you had said so Jay can hear it because he wasn't here at that meeting and I thought it was a pretty important point that you were making. Sure. Um, so I guess right there's there was two things right is the the immediate issue about what the expectation is in in um, having commuters come back to um, to work and use transit in general right and I. Um, I know that um, right. The the projections are that they're right. They're another two years out. That's what the MBTA is saying. And Jay, you might have some additional insight on that. But that was the last thing that I saw from um, from the board that was presented to the board. Um, but the the other thing is that um, you know actually right before the pandemic started, the um, the MBTA started. Uh, modifying the way that they're um, they're running the trains. So instead of being uh, peak period focused, they're starting to 
to um, change the service schedules so that they're um, more like hourly and, and all day type of a focus um, because that's the way that they see things happening even pre, pre COVID. Um, and so it's not just the fact that people aren't using the commuter rail to go into the, into the city anymore. The MBTA is actually making structural like infrastructure changes and operational changes so that their um, the demand that we saw back in 2019, it um, isn't going to be the same even when it, it when and if it does come back. Just because there's not going to be as many trains at 7 a.m. There just there aren't. Um, those trains may be full, but they won't. They, there won't be that same number of trains. They're going to stretch them all out through the course of the day. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I knew that they were going that way. I think you actually have more recent information than than I knew. Um, but I it, it makes sense based on conversations that I've heard about some of the commuter rail lines that maybe are just going to. It depends on, you know, the folks that can work from home and the areas right. where they where they are. Um, those haven't seen the ridership that some of the very robust um, bus lines and some of the other rapid transit lines are where right. it's first responders and right. folks that are needed so, to be there. Yeah, so specifically, I know they did that on the Worcester line. Um, they, they changed that whole schedule, which makes sense, right, through Wellesley and you know, um, some of those communities where, the, you know, there's more, the, the um, maybe more lawyers or folks that can, can work from home, typically, uh, that, that take that. Um, so, you know, but that is the, the pattern that they're, they're, they're um, what they're doing in, uh, across the entire system. Um, so that's why, the reason I brought that up is, is, you know, like we, we ought to be thinking about that, um, and I, I, right, no one knows how that plays in terms of parking demand, um, but it will be different, and that's that's sort of as as, as much as as probably anyone can say at this point um, that we shouldn't expect um, the use of the commuter rail to be the same, and certainly not the pattern of you know everyone rushing in there at you know at at eight a.m. Um, and taking up all the spots, that, that's going to change. Do you mind if I just ask one quick um, question? Uh, are we having uh, the MAPC, Cassia, is she presenting? Because that's what the last thing I'd heard, but I didn't see her on the agenda. Julie, you might have information on that. Yeah, so I gave the um, park an update last time. Um, that when I reached out to them, I had talked to Kasha and her team and um, they have a lot of deadlines this month. They couldn't make either of our meeting nights um, and they have a lot of other bigger projects they're working on this month. So they were gonna have trouble figuring out when to prepare and when to schedule. And I thought that given um, your schedule where you're almost like having your forum and then ready to present your recommendations, um, that it would be hard to figure out when to have them come in February or March. Um, and so instead they sent a bunch of materials, which I forwarded to everybody. Um, okay. Yeah, I saw those. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Everyone. Appreciate it. No problem. I think Julie's guest speaker is, is probably better anyhow. <laughs> no disrespect the, from, from anyone in MHTC. So I guess the, um, I don't know if, I'm going to let you chime in, Andrew, if you have a, a full count on the employees. But um, but certainly, it sounds like we have you know more than adequate employee parking. I don't know if anybody has has any other feedback on that. But between the unregulated and the and the extended employee, is that is that sufficient? Plus, yeah. So the unre unregulated. And employee. Let's see if I can find that. So I think that I'd like to try and incorporate what John just said, or figure out how that may impact some of the spaces that um, 
are, are re resident only from 6 to 1030. I mean, John, do you think those are the spaces that we may have too many of based on if we had a magic crystal ball to guess what we could unregulate so that it could be open for all? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, let's let's like let's think about how this this is likely to transpire or could transpire, right? So I, I think it's probably fair to say um, that over the next two years um, that that demand won't be there. That's everything that I'm hearing, you know, across the board. Um, so I, I guess I I'm feeling pretty confident that 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 demand won't be there. The question that I have is, you know, I, I know, right, uh, that we have early on, we talked about how, you know, we don't want to keep changing regulations. Um, and so, right, we don't want to change it and then change it in a year and change it again in a year. But I guess in this condition, um, I, because, you know, year four and five, from now, who know right? Who knows what that's going to be like? Um, it's likely that that demand won't be there, but you know, it, it could be. Um, and so, right, we sort of need to figure that out. But it'll be right. It'd be awful to hold on to that park parking for something that's gonna happen four or five years from now, right? That that's sort of seems silly as well. So I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think in the short term, it it's pretty evident that that, that commuter rail demand is not gonna exist for the next couple of years. Do you want me to find someone within the commuter rail department who could maybe speak to that to our group? Would that be helpful? How would that change? I'm just trying to figure out what John's saying and how, what the proposal is. I mean, we, is it so to I try to the, make them more available to, to employees? Yeah, I, I mean, because when we heard from the, you know, the dentist had 30 and Dowd had 20 and the foot and ankle people had whatever. And all those folks were saying that they weren't comfortable going up to Woburn, Woburn Street, particularly in bad weather or in the dark. And I know we were waiting to hear back a little bit on what areas people thought were unsafe. If we can concentrate more of that employee parking down towards the train station, again, just trying to fulfill that goal of getting employees out of the parking lots behind. But again, uh, yeah, and it sounds like, I mean, we could have, they could park in the parking lot if they want to pay, right? So that's possible for them. We give them that option. Yeah, but we, we don't really want them saying like, oh, yes, I'm going to use up all the kiosk spaces. Again, the whole point is we're trying to get employees out of the parking lots. Yeah. Right. I think, Liz, to go back to your original question, I don't. I think the reason why we didn't want to just let them park there right now is because like last year when we took away enforcement because of COVID and now this year we're back to it, it upset everybody and they're acting shocked like it never was there. So I don't want to do anything short term. But if you guys you know, think it's years out, then it definitely makes sense. Well, no, I mean, Christine, what we're talking about now is like actually changing the regulation and creating. Right. No, you know, that would be stuff. great. That's just why we don't want to do it like temporarily again, because they, they get upset every time and they act like it's new every time. No, that's fair. I, I was just spitballing so that you, you know. No, I totally hearing. understand. I understand the frustration down there. Yep. But it would seem with the lease spaces and the Vine Street spaces, there's more than adequate parking for those people and it's very close. So it, it's not though, that's the thing, like between Dowd alone is 20 of those spaces and the pediatric dentist is was 30 plus. And so that's yeah. only 41. Dowd, Dowd, I thought was like closer to 35 or something. Didn't I ask that? Or... Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. All the numbers were yeah, much higher than any of us anticipated. That was That was clear. And then you also have the Vine Street. I thought that Vine had that uh, additional. Well, did I lose my no? Vine had that. I mean, I think what you're you know what you're trying to do is take away the commuter rail parking and making it available. Is it only for employees? Or I mean, I just think that just yes, make it, it more two hour or all day with employee permit. Or all day with uh, with resident. No, two add, hour or all just, day with employee. Well, why why would we why wouldn't we make it unregulated? Because we're not going to increase the number of permits necessarily for employees, 
And well, that, I mean, I think that's something we actually should consider doing because right now we have businesses with 30 employees and we're telling them they can only get five permits. Right. And if other businesses go into some of the vacant buildings and all these other projects that have other employees that are going to be moving into town to work them. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I feel like less regulating of the spaces would be more appealing to everybody. In oh, sense. yeah, that's a good idea for the, the ones at the train station. Yeah, right. you know, just make those. Enough walk for some people, but I think that we've got a lot of signs and a lot of regulations on things that, you know, it's far enough away from some stuff that it's just open. And, and you know, if people want to, I think it solves a lot of different things. I think commuters could park there or, or, or employees or, you know, residents or whomever, but not, but we don't have, I mean, that still has to be revisited, I'm thinking, because, well, I guess unregulated is unregulated, so it really doesn't matter who parks there. Yeah, I think you've hit on it, Karen. I mean, I think the, I think a larger, uh, a proportion of the spots at the station should just be unregulated, I think that's a great idea. So they're unregulated except for 1.30 to 6 a.m., does that still stay in effect? Yeah, the overnight parking is a whole separate issue. Okay. I'm just thinking when you say unregulated, it's like, yeah, 24-7. <laughs> you know? No, it's like like Linden Street's unregulated. Anybody can park there for as long as they want. So right. Unregulated. You're right. Right now, any regulations are only between eight and five anyway. Right. Other than the, the overnight thing is just a blanket rule different than the parking mm -hmm. signs. Uh, that applies to the entire town, Correct. not just downtown. Um, you know, unless we address it, but um yeah, I mean, you don't want to have someone from Postmark park in their second or third car down there. <laughs> but right now, um, since nobody's using the commuter rail, employees can park there anyway. And but no, well, not until can... after, not if they don't have a resident permit, they can't until after 1030. Yeah, but they can. Well, right now, yeah. So, but if we reduce mm -hmm. that to 930, then they could park there. And a lot of people, I mean, I've been down there a lot and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people um there's still a lot of empty spaces around 9 9 30 which tells me that there are a lot of other people that might not get in there until later anyway but i mean there's if if they're not using that's that unregulated after 10 30 space now what makes us think that if we make it more unregulated they're going to use it anymore because they're not using it at, at this point anyway. Because there are employees that get there at seven in the morning, and so they're trying to find they're somewhere else. Right. But they already have, you know, that somehow they're already finding places to park. They're not. They're getting tickets all the time. <laughs> That's what we right. were hearing from them. But we're, yeah. But either we're going to allow them to buy a lot more parking, employee parking spaces, or we make it well, more. We're going to be able to sell them sixty parking stickers. So we, there's a limit to the number of stickers. So, you know, unregulated, even on Woburn Street, they, need, they can either park for two hours or they need a sticker, but there's a huge portion of employees that are not going to get a sticker. Yeah, unless we change that. that. But, but we can't change it because the policy of the police department is only to go like 20% or so over the number of spaces that we have. So right. it, the unregulated doesn't mean it starts at 9.30 or 10. It means starting at 6 a.m. till midnight, somebody can park there for however they want. Karen, I'm just thinking, I wonder if it should be unregulated or with employee sticker, because if it's unregulated, that means anybody can come even who was outside of Reading, right? But they can already park, they can already park in the, you're right, but that yeah, would be commuters that would be parking from out of town. And if we're saying that the commuter numbers are going down, we're not going to go back up again. They're not parking there now anyway. And they're not parking on my street anymore. They're not parking on Woburn Street anymore. So I think I don't, I, I don't know. I think we can't make regulations assuming that, I mean, I think four years is a long time. I mean, this could be six months and people are back. Mm -hmm. Once, once the big employers like Fidelity and Putnam and State Street and uh, all the consulting firms, once they say come to work, um, there was already a shortage of commuter spaces anyway, and uh, 
they're going to they're going to start filling up. So I mean, I just think that we need to assume at some point they're going to be there and and develop regulations as such, instead of pretending that it's it's never going to be needed again for commuters. I mean, Bernie, I think we're maybe pretending that it's going back to something when we've just heard a lot of information from John that that actually isn't the case, even even before COVID, just things are changing. Yeah, but I mean, uh, yes, I mean, if we want, if, if we're assuming that the MBTA mm -hmm. or the commuter rail is going to make it more difficult for people to use the commuter rail, I suppose that's, you know, if that's what you're saying, I, I, I kind of find it hard to believe that if they're getting it, all this money. No. It, so what they're doing right they're they're re character re uh, they're changing the way the care uh, commuter rail is going to be used right they what have determined that, that, sure that there's what does that mean is that, that that just means that the schedule is going to be different right yeah they're they're focusing more, less on um, less on uh, people from uh, getting people from Reading into downtown Boston and more focused on getting people around, um, sort of around the city. So mm -hmm. back and forth all day long, using it, using it, not just to get to work, but as part of their day, daily life, like transit, not like commuter rail. Yeah, another so, thing uh, on that, John, is uh, I don't know if anyone's uh, noticed, uh, and it might have be COVID related, uh, the MBTA now uh, does not start or end a train in Reading. All the trains from North Station go through to Haverhill, and all the trains start at Haverhill. So we've kind of, with that process, eliminated any advantage of anyone driving down to Reading that you may want to grab a, a train that isn't going to be full. And they've also cut out some trains because uh, I, I personally have a, um, uh, my son's fiance that uh, lost a train uh, because of that. She used to go uh, and grab a train that started in Reading and went into North Station for uh, her work. Uh, she has to get an earlier or a later train, but the train doesn't generate in Reading anymore or, or come out to Reading. And part of that, when she inquired, they said was uh, obviously their employees, they're having trouble uh, staffing the trains. So uh, that's another thing we might consider where um, it might explain why some of those spots are, are open uh, now. Yeah, I mean, I would, get, I would just, I would just reemphasize that if we, if we keep it the way it is, I don't see <clears throat> what the detriment is for that. Um, if we want to create more employee parking, we can certainly add more employee parking in other streets as well. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't... Where do you propose we have employee parking that we haven't already addressed on the streets? Well, again, I mean, I, I just, you've got Vine Street, you've got... Uh, I mean, any unregulated spaces are already employee, right? And I just think we have such a such a large number of employee potential spot, spot spaces, not just what's designated, but the unregulated. I think we've we've added sixty three spaces. That's that's a considerable increase. I think we did a pretty good job of that. But when you also look at it, how frustrating is it to see all that open parking and nobody be allowed to park at it until ten thirty? But it's available to anybody. If we make it 930, it's Even available then, to anybody, right? That part of town, the, the other parts of town where it, the stores don't open until 10 or 11, that works perfect for them. But for that part of town, for employees or for residents or whomever, it, it's not satisfying the need. And, and I'm sure people that live down there or people that live in Postmark or wherever it is, you know, it's frustrating to see all that open parking not being used and for us to not have us. I think the reason it's not being used, Karen, is because nobody needs to use it. Anybody they that do wants need to, to use it, Bernie. They just need to park earlier than it's available. It's there's no reason not to solve the employee parking problem. Where are they? Problem. Where if if they're not if 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 that's that item is restrictive. We could just eliminate the time frame, right? Uh, 
but uh, but I mean, I it, it seems to me like it's it's not going to really change things a whole lot because if people needed to use it, they would be using it. And they, they're not using it. They are not using it because even they're not using it because the dentists and the doctors can't get in there during the time. I guess the question is where where are they where are they going? They're, they're not they're not being absent from work, right? So they are using it. They are getting finding spaces somewhere. We're and they're getting tickets because they're fine. They don't have appropriate spaces. That's what we heard from them. They got ticket upon ticket upon ticket because they do Deputy, not have enough appropriate parking. That's exactly maybe, what we're trying to solve. Maybe Deputy Chief, you could give us some information as to how many of these employees are getting tickets every single day. Um, we have been issuing about, uh, it started in the month of December, we issued about 12 a day to employees that were in the wrong spaces because there weren't any in the Brandy Court lot that have their ticket or they're just not even near an employee ticket, but they are, and they don't have one. So, um, but my suggestion overall, it would be, I, it helps, I think all of us, if we make the employee parking very clear. So wherever you want to do it, um, I wouldn't leave it unregulated, especially, I know we're one of the only train stations that it, um, doesn't pay the MBTA. So I would be afraid that outsiders would find out that we have free, you know, they can park way down a vine unregulated. So I just think it would be better if we do make more employees, we make it very clear. So we can always show employees where they can park. So we are, are giving still, out several tickets a day, definitely for employees. Is that in, in January? So there was an initial, it was an yeah. initial. I there, haven't there was checked like in the last a day week or two. Mm -hmm. So maybe not more than 10. I, I, I can get back to you. I don't want to make up a number. Yeah. I, I mean, it just it seems like we're trying to solve a problem that is not all that much of a problem. No, there's definitely places for them to go. They don't want to walk very far, but it would be nice, I think, to give some more down there uh, with a pass, though. I, I wouldn't want to just leave it open because then it, I think in a few years it will come back to come at us. But So you think those areas um, would be similar to the other ones? But could we... But could it be employee parking all day starting at like 6 a.m. as opposed yeah, to? Yeah, that would be, yeah, that's fine. We can change that from 8 to 6 um, if the select board would vote on that because we'd have to make that a new article. Uh, but I definitely think it's easier for us if we make like very designated regulations in that area because that area of Vine and High wasn't regulated years ago and people, um, anybody could park there and it kind of became like, oh, we should give the residents more. These are out of towners coming to our train station. So. If we want to give employee more, I just think we should make it very clear. I agree. I don't know that you need to change the um, the regulation because if people are parking there before eight, you guys don't start counting the time until eight anyway, do you? Right. Correct. Yep. So you could still just leave it as is. You don't need to do any big legislation. Okay. Yeah. The only, true. Except if somebody did park there, they wouldn't have to move till 10. No, no. I'm saying if we turn it into employee all day with permit, the regular two hour or all day with employee permit. That starts at eight. If somebody gets there with an employee permit at seven, you're not oh, even. Oh yeah, the, the, if they get there first, yeah, they're fine. It yep. doesn't matter. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular place down there that you think would be best for employees, as opposed to you know what I mean? Like there's. Yeah, different... I mean I know it's been like the furthest, but by, like more really goes from high to vine is really wide open, especially this year and last year. Okay. I mean it's still a little walk from some of them at Brandy Court but it's a nice designated area right there, I think. And I'm um, sorry, Andrew, can you screen share the map? Just so we can all be clear about what, what areas we're talking about. Thanks. So I also just wanna make sure that everyone knows the 41 spaces that you have on this map is already done. They already are employee only. That was done two years ago. Um, so I don't want you to think if I'm not sure if you guys are considering that you're adding 40 because that those lease spaces already did change. Yeah, I don't know. I, that was, I don't know if I'm confused, but <laughs> no, I think no, that should have been in our that should have been in our base employee space count. Okay. Yes. That's and that's what is that 71? Is that or is that uh, that 41 that's written in by in the blue? Um, that's what we're talking about, right? There's 41 there now. Right, so that, that is in our total of 150 that we have currently. And you're thinking that we have 150 designated have, employee spaces? Yep. Yes. Right now. Yep. 
So one. And we're sold out of passes and no um, companies were allowed to buy more than five this year because we did sell out already. So where, where is it, is it my, um, did I hear you right, Andrew, that we have, um, we're adding 63 new spaces. 63 right there. Um, yeah, he has it on the table. There's 30 on yeah, Woburn right Street. Yep. Yeah. So we're adding 63 to 150. That gives us 213. And if we go back to the map, um, and Vine Street has how many additional? Is it 42 plus 46? Is that right? Or is because yeah, the are, Vine Street end is 46. And so the 42 are included, and what about the 11? The 11's commuter or resident only? A resident, but would we be turning that over to employee and, and or um, resident? Or should this all just be categorized as the same thing? Two hour or employee? Yeah, the way it's written in the traffic rules, that kind of goes together. It's a two hour yeah. and all day employee, yep. yep. But, uh, but it also has the, uh, and then what about these, the yellow, the yellow um, marked spaces on those sides? So is there 42 on one side of the street and then there's yellow uh, on the other side of the street? Is that, am I thinking about that right? 42 is right next to the train and the 46 on the other side of the street. And that's the entire, uh, so, it looks like that would be more than 46 because if 42 is just that one, that one line across the street, there would be another 42. And then I would think that the 46 is beyond that perpendicular mark to the train station. So it is that potentially 480? There's curb cuts and for some of the driveways. So it's, it's not a straight shot. Yeah, oh, that's right. And it starts so halfway down. down where the 42 is. It starts halfway down there going all the way up. So is the 46, is there another 46 on one side of the street and another 46 on the other or? I mean, no, you can, only park on on you can only park on one side. It's a tricky street. I actually believe a portion of the street is no parking in general, not just no parking, 6 to 10, 30. It's Flat. I was yeah, going to say, I thought Vine Street was no parking. At, the, the yellow there, yeah, it's correct. It's no parking from 6 to 1030. So it's like opposite of our resident pass and no one uses it that I've ever seen. So you can park tractor trailer trucks there all day. It, like it, it's never used. Do we know how many parking passes were issued last year when there wasn't a cap? Like it was like 400 or is it like something like 250 that were? No, so last year, uh, the initial front load was 130 and then Dowd and a couple other people were allowed to buy the extra 20. So we got up to 150 again, um, okay. but they were allowed more, but this year we sold out faster. So how many do you think that we could sell beyond that? Just still the two medical places or like, do you think there's other businesses that require more? There's a couple more in town, I think. Besides, yeah, there's a few, several um that i've heard from that would like more than five and i will say that i didn't actually buy more than one this year but if the fee comes down, like i would like to buy at least five i just have not so liz you would agree though that you're not going to use all five at the same time we would not no right so christine where in the other parts of town are, are companies that would want more spaces. So we've been focusing on Dowd and the dentist and down on, on the Harnden Brandy Court side. Are there others in other part of town that would need more? The only people that um, I've heard a few issues with once we started issuing tickets was a few employees up um, in the CVS area, like Cafe Nero. They just, but they are, I think, were new employees that didn't even know about our program for over the last year because we weren't enforcing for so long. Um, so no, all of my issues really are the police department that we hear from is really Brandy Court and Dowd Medical on High. Um, I don't get many complaints up the other areas, no. But I, I will say, you know, for the people up on up on the Main Street area where I am, I know that a fair number of employees of all the businesses around there have been 
frequenting the CVS lot. And, um, you know, when these enforcements really go into place, um, they will be wanting to use the real employee spots. And so I do think it is worth considering upping the limit significantly just because so many of these type of retail businesses, you, you just don't have people working at the same time. So you'd have, you know, more permits than would ever be in play at the same time. Because it's just so many part-timers as opposed to these, you know, full-time medical people. I just have a quick question about how we calculate. If, if we say we come up with a, you know, 200 employee spaces, did you say we, then you can issue stickers for 20% more? So we so. used to do that. And then we got a lot of people coming in complaining, saying they can't find a space. So we stopped mm -hmm. overselling. Um, we thought it would rotate, but it didn't. And I don't know if that was just certain areas, but so we did stop that. Um, I wonder though, if we change the fee from, you know, we were talking about instead of 200, whatever, if we were talking about something more reasonable, like 25 or 50, I don't know that you'd have people complaining if once in a while they couldn't find a space. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, we try to make it very clear now when they buy stuff, we give them the map. So as long as we make it clear that this, you know, it's a little, we're a little over to allow and you're not always guaranteed a space, especially where you want. Yeah. Yeah. And they can always walk a little bit further to the unregulated spaces, right? That's what we've been talking about for six months is that we've got places people just have to walk a two or three minutes. And so but, even but without this, adding... Excuse me, Bernie, I'm sorry. Even without adding um, extra spots on the MBTA line, we would be over 200, right? It's 150 and we're going to add 63. So then if we add more, we, could, we might even be up at like 225. Is that right? Or we could add, I was thinking we could add the 46 on Vine and then we could be at, um, you know, 259. And, and we have what about 2,500 spaces in total. So we'd be giving 10% of all the spaces to employees, which is considerable. I and mean, I think we're, we're being extraordinarily flexible. And uh, I mean, it would seem like that's a, that's a reasonable amount. And that 46 in Vine, it seems like that's where we have the highest need for the medical practices. Is that right? Right, up, right on that corner, Woburn and... Well, except that's, I think that's further up than you think it is. Um, but well, I know it's a little further. It's a, it's yeah, a no, no, and I, I have no problem with that. I just, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I feel like we keep talking about Vine Street, and I feel like I know this chart says no parking six to ten thirty, but I'm like, I feel like part of this is really just no parking is possible at all. Andrew, yeah. are, do you have the magical? I am pulling map? it up as we speak because the, the map of reality. The same. But Christine, uh, did you say that nobody? hardly ever parks in Vine. I never see over. anybody there. And right, I, you I, can't um, park there, right? No, I mean, not there. It's further down. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Vine Street from Middlesex down to High. No, it's way, it, yeah, you're way up. Which is where the yellow is on the map. But that's the yellow, right. This is yeah. where the yellow was on that this map. Is where yeah, that no, here. no, keep going because I'm looking at the traffic rules and regulations book. Yeah, it's once you get down to that sign right there, it is you can just park school buses for days. Nobody ever parks over here. Right, but th these are the nose in to the track spots. There's this nothing the on the MBTA. other side of the road that we should be considering. Right, I believe these are the MBTA spots, no? 42? No, we took them back over, and I don't know why. I don't know if residents were asking for visitor parking, but we made it no parking from 6 to 1030. All these spaces. Okay. So, this so they are ours, and they are not used ever. Okay. Hmm. So those can be changed and it would be a lot of new spaces added to the pool. So you're saying these are not the, these are not the formerly leased spaces. No. Oh. These are yeah, let's let's add those to the pool. That's these footage. Yeah. But and to be what, clear, what? that yellow that yellow stripe above there is nothing. That is right. nothing. <laughs> That's what but we just saw. That, but aren't you saying, Chris, that anybody could park there? So there's, there's no parking just for a certain time period, but no, no, that, Bernie, we just parking. looked at the street. There is no physical parking until you get to those spaces where it says 42. It's, 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 it's mislabeled on the map. I'm confused. Christine, did you say that, they, that people could park there, but they just don't? That, that yellow space, which yeah, is Yeah, further down where we got to those marked numbered spaces, um, the they're, not, they're never utilized. That's not the yellow, side, though. That's the about, red. What about further down, 
where, where we see Arbor Way, Vine, and the 46. Do you see that 46? Right. Is there any reason you, right now you, that's no parking you, 6 to 1030? You can't, right. that's what we just looked at, Bernie. You can't, you physically can't park a car there. That is mislabeled. It's not that it's no parking. It is just you can't you park You physically there. can't park a car there. There's no check the other map to see. But I thought, Chris, you said that you could park there all day and nobody parks there. No, that's that's 42. I think the 46 is the issue that the 46 number shouldn't even be listed there. Those, That's just, you can only drive. There's no spots on the 46. But could there be if we needed it? No. no. To Could narrow you that, Christine? I'm trying to uh, pull up the other map for you guys to see what um, <clears throat> it looks like on the well, other one. Why that one looks An so confusing? Andrew just showed Andrew just showed us on on Street View, right? Right, and there are, but there are a lot of spaces down there, so I think the yellow is. Um, hold on, I'm just kidding. Now, Christine, oh, I think the 42 are the spaces that that little red stripe where it says MBTA owned town licensed residential permit. That's what you're thinking of. I guess you just got to go back to the Google map and see. What, yeah, see, that's why I always use another one. Middlesex Ave or Mount Vernon, which yes. where we're at. Yeah, so it basically the parking goes to just right at the split at Vine and Mount, like Vernon, like. Where so those Middlesex yeah, and Vine. Not very high up there, right. Which is the start of the 46 that was highlighted yellow. So all of this is yellow from right here down. And you can't park Right, it's I don't know like, why they put that. It's very narrow. Yeah, because that started at middle sex. And I think the parking is supposedly on the left-hand side, but it's a really narrow street. And you wouldn't be able to park by this brown fence. Well, I guess people could back out, but it's super narrow. Would we need to add some? Oh, there. Oh, there already is lighting there. Are those lights on at night? Yes. Well, huh. I think they are because I walk my dogs down there sometimes. Um, there's that section that had the gravel. Does that belong to the MBTA? I thought we said that that in a prior meeting. I thought we said that that might have been emergency access to the train tracks. Yeah, they probably made <laughs> access through there. So if we added the we added the the 42 right there 42 that would give us 255 wow which seems like quite a lot it's a doubling of the almost a doubling of the employee spaces is bernie is that not even including potential uh, mbta spots yeah, I'm, all I'm saying, I guess, is you maybe you don't, you don't, you wouldn't need to, to do to sacrifice the resident because you know you're trying to give residents who, who live and work, you know, live in town, you know, some uh, modicum of privileges so that they could have a resident sticker and park down there. And of course, anybody as a resident sticker could park there. It doesn't have to, they don't have to be commuting. They could be doing anything else. They could be working. They could be, you know, if you're if you're a worker, if you're a resident of Reading and you work downtown, you buy a resident sticker. If we make them all the same price as the employee, then we could, um, you know, we could even give more options to the employees. It seems like that's a, that seems like a reasonable win-win for everybody. Um, Deputy Chief, when they get their, um, when you talk to the employee people, do they, do you tell them that after, um, is it after 930 that they could also park at the train station without a sticker? We've just started doing that, yes, because, you okay. know, before it used to be full, but now that I, yes, that was something we've told them this year, yep. Okay, that seems like big news to me. <laughs> but it was always marked that way, people just had to figure it out. And, you know, usually people f figure stuff out with, if they actually really need it. Um, so, yeah, and as you say, Liz, a lot of people, 
I mean, a lot of employees don't go to work at seven o'clock downtown. I mean, I drive through there at eight, and nine o'clock sometimes, and it seems like it's still pretty dead. Um, you know, maybe that's just COVID, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it seems like if we added more, uh, if we added those 42 as well, we're up to 250 plus all the unregulated people want to walk a couple of minutes. You've got all the unregulated, which is close to Woburn. And it's not more than a two or three minute walk at most. So seems like we're being extraordinarily accommodating. John, as far as our conversation about not wanting to revisit this, you know, two years from now, four years from now, and Jay, as far as your knowledge for how we, uh, we don't know what's going to happen, um, how, or for all of us, do we think that we need to put something in our recommendation informing the select board about the possibility of it possibly changing or, or do you know what I mean? Like not just leaving it as an untouched subject because there is a potential that we might want to revisit it again or. So Karen, I'm uh, going to reach out to this group that's called the Office of Performance Management, um, OPMI. It's a group, MassDOT and MBTA share it. And I'm going to see if I can get any insights onto where they think projections of commuter rail uh, in this area will go to try to help uh, do that. And John might be doing something as well. Okay, yeah, I'm going to reach out to the commuter rail um, mm -hmm. folks to see what they're, um, if, if they have any different projections. Okay. I think we should put something in there so that at least we've touched and we're putting everyone on notice that it's likely going to either stay the same or change later. Agreed. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that makes sense. Right. So the next time, uh, if I understand you correctly, right. So then, so the next, when this becomes an issue, that there will start, sort of already be a. a um, stake in the ground saying, you know, this is the section to revert back to, um, to commuter, um, commuter rail parking because the demand is back. Right. I guess fundamentally what we're asking, what we're asking them is, would they agree that we should make less parking available for commuters? Is that something that they would be in favor of on a, on a more permanent basis? I guess, I'd be I'd be yeah. interested in in hearing what their what their recommendation would be for us to uh, eliminate more commuter rail parking, or uh, keep it the same. I would I would think that if I was running a commuter rail, I would want to make it more easy for people to use my service, and therefore would be in favor of having a, as much parking as possible for them. Would you agree with that? Am I wrong on that? I would agree with that. They'll be hesitant. When you say they, I thought you were talking about, when you were saying we want to ask them, I thought you were talking about the select board. Oh, no, 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 about, no, you're asking about the MBTA? The conversation that we were talking about, Jay and John, going to the, going to the public transit people and asking them what their projections were for potential ridership numbers, right? That's what we were talking about. And so I just simply added the point that if we're gonna ask them what their projections are, we should also ask them whether they would recommend us to reduce the number of parking spaces at um, available for commuters. Because if you're gonna ask them about the, the, the ridership numbers, you should probably ask them the same you know, the question about their recommendation for us with respect to, um, sure, but respect right, to car, we, you know, would we, you agree that that's, need, a, that's a sensible uh, follow on question? Yeah, we need to recognize the, per, the single perspective that they'll come, they'll answer that with. But yeah, we Obviously, can, yeah. I'll, I'll ask them the question, right? Because they're not balancing right. anything else, right? They have a, a sure. single purpose. So. All right, so are we, uh, are we agreeing that, um, 
the additional 42 spaces on um, making sure that we're not we don't, we're not assuming we have jurisdiction of did, did you say Christine that this was we this have was signage the, up there and we regulate it now so and it's our spaces it's not the never MBTA touched it. spaces we plow it yep okay so we have the authority maybe to come steal it from us someday but right now we handle that those spaces yep okay so Andrew you are we in agreement that we would take those 42 and add them as well to the employee parking Yes. And that gives us a total inventory, we think, of 255. Just to be clear, um, would this also include two hour or all day with employee just to be consistent with the rest of Yes. This? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. So in addition to this, we have we have many we have many unrestricted spaces and the possibility of kiosks if that's the way we design it. But um, wow. So hopefully the employers will appreciate the fact that we've listened to them and tried to make accommodations. Now, I guess the only question is whether we should increase the number of permits that businesses are allowed to buy. Um, and I guess is that a, a re, right now we don't restrict it in terms of as a function of the number of employees, but I mean, I suppose if somebody had, if we, if we increase the limit, the only thing we have to watch out for is that if somebody has, let's say seven employees, but they buy 14 passes, does that make sense for us to do? Why in the um, world would they do that? To offer them to their friends or whatever, I don't know. Again, I, mean, I don't think people are running the grift on employee parking permits. It's not. Not, not at the price we're selling it for now, but because um, right now it's, it's, a, uh, it's a placard that you hang from your mirror, right? It is, and I'm sure that if we feel like that there is corruption happening, that even though the pass is transferable, I'm sure we could make the application require just listing employee names. How do we how do we control that now, Christine? Um, right now you just have to. We don't check on employee names. You know, some employees, certain stores, you know, have a lot of turnover or restaurants and such. But um, we just have the business itself. Well, we have a list of all the businesses in town. And um, we just double check that they have a business and an address in Reading. Okay. And if we, right now the five isn't a big deal, but if we made it, if we made it 25. Um, right, we did a survey uh, a couple years ago and that's where we came up with the number five. So a lot of places don't have a lot of employees or the ones that have a lot maybe didn't fill out our survey, so. And I will say I when I filled out that survey a few years ago, I had half the employees that I have now. So that's yeah, no, I'm, I don't want to base anything off that. I just don't want anything you guys. Oops, sorry. Uh, I don't want there are a few new have. businesses moving into town and other developments. So that's just something to be weary of. If the, these passes are already selling out pretty quickly. So to allow more might just limit the number of businesses who can get them. Yeah, I mean, if we do yeah. something similar to the phased approach that, you know, five five permits up until X date, and then if people, if they aren't sold out, then allow another round or something like that. But it seems like if we're in increasing the volume of spaces by this much, that we might be able to make the base number 10 or something rather than five permits. Let's see how that goes. So for the medical practices, shouldn't we be offering them more since they have such a large number of employees? But that's why I was thinking that we should, we should um, permit the number of permits you can buy should be a function of your employees. You know, your sort of registered um, employees on your payroll register or something like that. 
that just seems like a lot of work for the police to have to monitor yeah. that kind of detail. Yeah, it's just trying to ma manage the unintended <clears throat> consequences of uh, of trying to be favorable and being more liberal, but you have to be careful that you don't make a situation where uh, people are gonna come back to us and say, why did you do that? When you, why didn't you think of this? That's Julie, what I'm trying to do. Yeah, Julie, when you were thinking about employee parking a couple of years ago on your first swag at this, did you have thoughts? Um, Cause I feel like your initial proposal was for a more liberal distribution of passes. Did you have any? thoughts on this uh i think she might have stepped away for a few minutes to... oh sorry i just scrolled down i didn't see no it. not in my view yeah the only thing what what we did over the years was it was only a few of the same businesses getting every passes coming in first so that's why we really tried to change the number to make sure that every business in town gets one but you know if we could come up with a scale of okay if you have 20 employees you get up to 10 bases at the beginning it, you know it would be good i can't do the math in my head right now what would work but um something like that i think would be possible if you know we're not going to check on employees but we're just going to trust the owner that's buying them but yeah i think actually you're right christine if you just like even list that as a gating you know if you have x number of employees you can apply for this many i think the honor system will actually you know would probably work out 99 percent of the time yeah, and you you always have the opportunity to catch somebody abusing the system and say, "Hey, look, your 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 passes that you bought in excess of your needs are going to be invalidated or something." So you, I think the issue that was the issue before, according to what John is saying, is no longer going to be the issue. Therefore. Any attempt of fraud, I don't think would really be existing anymore, um, in my opinion. Yeah, just a question of how many should we allow a business to to buy? That's really what we're trying to. I mean, resolve. five seems five seems just massively way too low, regardless. And I don't think you can just give exemptions for you know a, a dental and a doctor's office. I think, I mean, ten you're starting to get into the upper level and. I think, yeah, anything beyond that gets into the, you know, you're more than a small business after 10 employees. So, is well, this you know what I mean, by the government. Anyway. Is this something that we're supposed to decide or is this something the select board is supposed to address? I think we're just trying to make, we're just trying to make it easier for the select board. Yeah, so this actually, this part doesn't really go to the select board. The police department decides how we give them out and how many. Um, they just set up where they can park or vote on that. And then we handle how the passes get distributed. Okay. Thanks. But any recommendations are obviously welcome, but. So, you know, you can buy up to 10 and then if there are any, any left over, you can buy another 10 or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. It sounds like Christine in the park. What is that abbreviation? PTTF? How many uh, T's is it? Three. PTTTF. Oh. Yeah, they're the ones who really are going to. So I, I think I think Christine gets the gist of and and they can hammer that out. Yeah. Okay. Great. Very so exciting. The, so the other um, open item was um, over. Well, we have two open items: the cost of the permits and then overnight. Do we want to um, segue into the cost of the permits? We've been we've been batting around 25 does that uh do, do anybody have any thoughts on that i think it's way too low if anything it should be a sliding scale based off the employees so if you have five it's x amount and then when if you got into 30 like people can't be paying 250 like each one of these spots for that that just seems massively unreasonable so maybe if there was a sliding thing where like under five is this and then five to 20 or something is this like i think overall the not the price should should go a little a little bit lower but i mean that's my gist on it i i i think people having to get 30 or 40 and they're and they're not taking 30 to 40 spots they're taking like 20 out of the 30 or 40 they got for their extra employees so i mean doing a sliding scale like that benefits them greatly so so I'm sorry, Chris, were you saying 25 was too high? 
No, 25 is way too low. 250 or whatever we pay now is oh, gotcha. too high. Yeah. So, I mean, 100 is, uh, we could start from there, I guess. Like you have to make it where people still, yeah, abuse, et cetera, kind of thing. But you have to make it where, I mean, even saying $100 out loud seems low to me. But I mean, the 250, when you scale it out to five people, like you said, Liz, just, it seems unreasonable. So for me, I'm going to pay whatever it is. It, it could be a thousand dollars. It it didn't matter to me, but I'm not everybody else. And you know, uh, it's it should be a sliding scale after you get to a, a certain amount where it gets reduced significantly lower because they're not taking up the spots anyway. So I think that maybe 150, like it is for residents, is lower than it is now, and it's not giving it away for free. I mean, I think uh, I'm fine with making it uniform for everybody, but I think if you do, if you get over 20, then it should start scaling down to like a hundred or something when you hit like, it's, these people shouldn't be paying that much money and we're not here to make money off it. It's just the enforcement. So I'm not sure I'm in favor of a volume discount. I don't think I, mean, I, we are, I, mean, I think the idea is that the businesses get taxed a lot. Sorry, I can't. Who was trying to say something? I didn't catch that. I just, I think it's a business and I think that it's part of doing business and there's, they don't have to buy the spaces if it's too expensive. There's a lot of unregulated parking. Yeah, I agree with John. I don't. I'm not in favor of a volume discount either. Unless it's the other way around where it's more expensive when you buy more. I mean, I That's guess the question. issue that... Oh. But just my thing is they're not taking the spots. If, if Dowd has... If they want to get 40 and they only have 20 people there every day, we're penalizing them for getting... You know what I mean? Like spot, they're not actually taking up the spots though. And why are they buying? Then why, yeah, why are we giving them a discount for convenience purposes? It's, I mean, it's you can say that so they, you know, four, it, two. Like where it, is that threshold? Someone buys four, they're really only taking up two spots. So why don't they get a discount? I, because that's that's just based off like in general, you're charging Dowd for say 35 spots. Now, do I think Dowd can afford it? Most likely, but that's not... It, it just seems like that gets into the, like what if Dowd had a hundred employees where we're still okay with charging them full price for all of it, even though only 20 would be there during a cycle every day. Yes, it, because it's, there's regu unregulated parking that we've been talking about forever that they can park. It's their choice to buy the passes. It's not. But it's, but Christine just said that we want to have outlined spots for employees to be able to say, here, we can go here, not just, you can park wherever you want or wherever you feel like it. Like, yeah, I mean, it's just my opinion. Everyone can disagree with it. I'm fine with it. I'm just saying it my, I just think it should be a sliding scale. Maybe after 20 passes, it goes down to a hundred bucks or something. So, or not. I mean, it just seems... The way that it is, 250 or what, I believe it's 250, but it just seems unreasonable for larger businesses like that to pay. So not sure if this is possible, but Chris, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, there's a difference between the number of passes that you issue and the number of passes that are being used at any one time. Not sure. sure if there's a way to enforce, like say someone buys 10 passes, but they only pay to use four you pay the amount you're going to use at any one time. Then if there was ever five passes, they would get charged like a ticket. But I don't know how you'd enforce that. No, we'd never, we'd never be able to enforce that. It's more of only, uh, according to the numbers or whatever, only like four or five businesses are going to take advantage of anything over 10 at this point is what it's seeming like. So all, mm -hmm. all we're doing is is discussing anything over that that threshold, which is just a handful of businesses. So, I, I mean, that's just me. We can keep it 150 for everyone. I just think that when, when you get into that realm of, of people not actually taking these spots, just doesn't seem reasonable to me. And, and just get it, giving them a little bit of a break um, based off that volume seems better, but. I guess, one, you know, the way, another way to think about it, and I'm, 
I'm reading the email that um, the orthodontist wrote, and they were clearly pointing out that you know we have X number of employees, and oh by the way, we bring in 150 to 200 people into our office every day. I, I, well, 150 to 175. I don't know what the something like 175 people come into our office every day. That's pretty good for business in downtown. And, uh, you know, I think about that and I say, you know, the businesses are, you know, in theory, we want businesses downtown and we want them to, to prosper and thrive. And we want those businesses to bring customers in for other businesses. And, you know, in my mind, it just makes sense to try to make make it less frictional on all these businesses. You know, it's hard enough, you know, ma managing these businesses. And, you know, this is not something the town is gonna make any money on for, for all practical purposes. We've already heard from staff that it's not about the money. It's just trying to accommodate people so that there's less friction coming and going out of downtown. If that's what we, if that's what we want. Uh, and, you know, 97% of the people and our survey said that the only way they get to town is by driving. So, um, you know, the more the more friction that you put up, the more they're going to go somewhere else. We heard that loud and clear in the survey as well. So I just kind of feel like it's not a big deal. It's not going to make or break the town. Um, you make it easy for people, and let's move on and do and, and go to the next big project. If I could just say, I think you should think about pricing this at the same time as you're pricing the kiosk slots, because you want to make sure that it's cheaper to park outside than inside all day, because they'll do it if it's closer. That's so good. I think you got to think about both pricing. And, the, and they a can wise always... woman. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Here and for a while. Can... <laughs> and right now, the way it works, Christine, is that they get something that they hang on their mirror, right? Yes. So if, if they wanted to, they can buy so many spaces. And if they don't have employees all working exactly the same hours all day, every day, they could swap off the use of these passes from one employee to the next. And yes. it would economize it for them too. Yep. That was one of my quick questions for Liz. So Liz, you have a lot of employees that are all part-time, right? Yep. So do you hang on to all these things? And then when they show up, you dole out the thing or do you just <laughs> how would how would that work? I was just wondering. Like, it's like it's similarly for Cafe Nero, where they have so many people that are there part time. I mean, do, do when when someone is let go, you're you like, and don't forget to bring back that parking permit. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing, um, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I've not been in a position. I've I've only ever gotten a permit for one of my employees that was like the closest to full time. <clears throat> okay. Anyone in the past, so. We, and, and I also, it wasn't until recently that you could swap these. They were originally by license plate. Mm. Um, so in the past, it was specific to your car. Um, but in terms of how I would envision this going forward, um, yeah, we would probably have them at the store and then, you know, people invariably forget to bring it in, bring it out. And so there'll be a fair amount of like, oh, let me go grab that out of the car, you know. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll get a spot <laughs> close enough that it's not insane. Um, but yeah, that's part of, I mean, and that's part of why I would probably err on buying, you know, more rather than fewer, e even though I tend to only have three people on at a time. <laughs> you know, I do have 12 people and I can't assume that everybody's going to remember to take the thing out of their car and bring it in for the next person or whatever. So I'd probably buy, you know, five or six be a, besides my own, given the given the chance. Yeah, and if if, if they were a hundred bucks each, and you got five, that's five hundred, and you just paid five hundred for two of them. So I mean, it's it's even easier on you to, you know, kind of not have to to handhold a parking permit. Like, it just seems crazy to me. Just it's just you want to make it as easy as as you can on your employees and everyone else up there. So. That's why reducing the rate on, on something that, you know, from 250 to 100 bucks or whatever seems worth it, or 150, whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I think, I think one or 150 are both reasonable price points. And obviously, to Christine's point, we need to then do the math versus the kiosk. Um, 
And Chris, while I appreciate your volume discount concept, I think that, um, again, I, I want to keep this as simple as possible for the police department. We don't need to make this a big calculus. And, you know, again, these, these larger companies, larger organizations that have that many employees, in, in theory, they should, you know, if they're considering that like an, a benefit package for per employee, it probably just feel, fits into their calculations. So I, I don't think that we need to scale on a volume basis. I think that's just needlessly complicated. Personally, if it's a, if it's a minimal, if, if it's a, if it's a less frictional cost to begin with, you can, you can sort right. of build One, that in. 100 or 150 price. is already so much less than the 250 or 260 that it is yeah. now that it's. I mean, a hundred isn't going to make a big difference to the small businesses because they're going to pay. I mean, if it's, it could be 50, 75, a hundred, I don't mean, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. We just pick a number and move on. I'm down with that. So, I pick a number till we talked about the kiosk pricing. Right. Yeah, so but I mean, any, kiosk. any number is going to be, I, I would say just to Christine's point, uh, if you pick a, if you pick 75, let's say, and then anybody's going to pay 75 for a parking sticker because it's cheaper than the kiosk, no matter what you do the kiosk pricing at. Yeah, you'd have to do the parking pass at like, I don't know, I'd have to bust out quick math at this moment on the spot. But I think if you extrapolate that out, you're probably paying like $3,000 to park for the whole year, because you're going to blow through, even if it's $5 a day times 20 days, like that's, you know, 100 bucks right out the gate times 12 months, that's 1200. Like, so yeah, any figure that we do for these kiosk things is going to just get blown out by the employees doesn't matter what the cost of the permit is. I still think the cost needs to be at the same as for a resident because- I, I agree with Karen on this. Maybe <laughs> yeah, let, let's use 150 as the holding number. Yeah. And then if we have some mm -hmm. other math revelation, but right now it's just a 150. <laughs> I think we have three people from, or two people from the public on. The public. The public. There was a Jack, but he just dropped off. Scared them away. So are we, why don't we just finish this? I mean, okay. I mean, I would propose a hundred. Is, is there a problem with a hundred? We were saying that 150 is the same as the resident. And yeah, so that would could, just be consistent. You could also, but the, the, there are two residents right now. One of them is lower than the other. One is just for the dump and what's for parking. But if I was a resident and I had a business downtown, it would be cheaper for me to buy employee pass. So why wouldn't I buy a resident pass? So I think it's safer to avoid any fraud that you've been concerned about is to keep it at 150. Sounds good. I'm fine with the 150. It's less than what it is. That's right. So it benefits everybody. Now, would you, would we consider the resident going down? I mean, I think that would be, I mean, people are already paying taxes. We got a lot of comments like that. I don't, think that's part of our, I don't think that's part of our scope. Bernie, you mean like a senior citizen's discount or something? Or? No, I mean, I'm just saying that the residents, I don't know what the typical payment for resident taxes is, but I mean, I think a lot of the, originally the, the um, you know, it was $25 for a resident permit plus 10 for each additional car. And I think that's kind of the benchmark that I'm thinking about. How many is resident is permits are issued currently? Are we talking like 500 or like 20? It was, the number it was a lot. It, I forget the numbers. I have them. Um, I want to say, was it 1300? And then it went down to 800 when it was, when it was raised. Is I might that many? I Christine, you sent that to us a while ago. Do, do we think changing that is going to change yes. people's um, um, uh, parking um Behavior? Habits, yeah, behaviors, yeah. I mean, or, I think are it's, we just having a conversation about money? No, I think so it's, it's about. Oh, sorry, eight hundred or so passes are parking only now. Um, but I, I know that the select really board they changed this just a few years ago, so I assume there was good reason why they wanted to up it to one hundred and fifty. Um, because I, no, think, I think the they, cost of the DPW down there and all the work they do, but 
Yeah, and it's so much cheaper than any other town that has a, a, a tea station. I have no qualms about the 150 amount. It's, a, it's still a huge bargain. Yeah, I think that the issue is if you get a couple of cars, it's, you know, then it, I think the problem is that it doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, if you get a couple of cars and you don't, and you don't kind of commute every day, it winds up disincenting you to do that and it, and it spills over into the unregulated parking. Um, that's kind of the way I've, you know, the way I've heard about it. So I think what they, it was originally 150, and then they changed it to 150 plus a smaller amount per additional car. But I guess my point is that there are two. It's not listed here, but I'm quite sure that we talked about this. And there's a a resident only X compost. Then there's another resident, which I thought was either 25 or free. Andrew, maybe you could help me out on that. Um, Sorry, what was that question? So there was a, there are two resident permit parking downtown. One of them was sort of like a, a downtown resident, and then there was a resident X compost. One of them was either free or 25. The other one was 150. 150 for the first, and then less for each. So again to try to steer this back to regulations um there is a regulation that those fronting a resident only or employee permit area get those permits for free and i believe if a resident got that sticker for free because they fronted a street with that regulation something like the corner was teared off and that would show that they don't have access or vice versa or something like that but again that's kind of the regulation i would like to steer back to if we can over pricing um that those fronting the streets currently get these permits for free which can take on supply um and again this corner thing and tough thing to manage so that might be worth the conversation if that should be kept or not. So I'm just confused on what, what this frontage issue is. Is this? So if, here's the map. If you are fronting and if you live on Chapin Ave and you're fronting employee parking, which some of these residents are, you get a free employee parking permit. And the same goes- Re for Resident those. or employee? Both. You, you said, get whatever is in before. front of your house. So we only have one resident sticker for everything. Um, so I don't know. So this one resident sticker, it's $150, and that's to park in all resident-only areas in all of town. Um, there's a few others outside of the downtown. Mm -hmm. Then there's a $25 compost-only sticker. If you buy the resident one sticker at $150, you also can go to the compost. And the only other thing that Andrew's talking about is um, these streets downtown, in the regulations right now, whatever regulation we put in that's in front of your house, whether it's employee or resident, you get that free pass. And they sometimes they would cut the police department cuts the corner so that they have to still buy a compost sticker. If that helps. And Christine, do they get these automatically or they need to come down and ask for it? They come down and ask. So it's not everybody, but there are definitely some that take advantage, you know, use it. Yeah, they wouldn't. Need it. And so some people who are like, no, no, I'm just parking in my driveway. I've got enough room. They don't. Yeah, exactly. So, so I don't think this is a huge right. burden on our parking inventory. And I think keeping that consistent with how it's been seems a reasonable assumption. But are we talking about, Christine, are we talking about they get an employee sticker or they get a resident sticker? So whatever regulation is in front of their house in particular, they get that pass. So like if you lived on Shapen Ave, you get an employee sticker hanging placard because our enforcement officer needs to know that that's what you're allowed to do in that area. But if you lived on Linden Street where it's resident only, we give you a resident only sticker. So we have every house number listed of who gets what if they wanted to come in. So the 40B properties and the resident, the residential downtown, they could all get residents only for nothing and then well, park on the street. If you want to hear the lawyer in me, which I'm not, uh, the regulation says your frontage has to be 
with the regulation and none of them the way they are their address doesn't come to that regulation if that mm -hmm. makes sense so none of them are actually available for it yet the way we are right now so because they don't have let's say 50 feet of frontage um, even though they have a condo or an apartment in in let's say the 40b they can't they cannot get a free resident parking permit. They would have to pay for it instead. Right, unless their address comes back to the exact street that the regulation's on, we don't give them free because that's the way it's written in the rules right now. So just as an example, Postmark is here, they're fronting Sanborn and Haven. There are no permit regulations there, so they don't qualify for free permits. But they could still buy a resident only. Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. That answers my question on that. So getting back to the um, the cost on that um, on the resident, I guess the um, the idea is that if somebody's already paying taxes in Reading as an accommodation and encouraging you to go downtown and shop, um, what's a what's a lower friction? price to charge for, for that. And I guess I would, um, yeah, I would say they'd probably drop it from where it is now. I don't, I don't think it, it really is think... our purview to be changing that. That's not what anybody's asked this committee to do. Yeah. Those permits Unless aren't it's... to encourage people to shop. They're in per helping people use the commuter rail if they need to. It's lower than any other town and those people pay taxes in their town. I don't think we need to incentivize people to get these employ these uh resident permits i think that's our job and the same could be said for employee is that what you're saying i'm not quite no the, the reason why we're doing it for employees bernie is because right we need to drive drive um yeah, change uh behavior right and there's nothing with dropping the price which is why i asked the question to begin with uh, there's nothing about dropping the price um for a residential sticker that we are looking to, to 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 change behavior parking behavior well it would keep people out of the key it would keep people out of the lots to begin with um it would it would encourage people to do that it would encourage people to to get off the roads and take the commuter rail so i mean there is potential for allowing that i mean if you've got if you've got two or three cars you're going to spend 450 dollars <laughs> to um or what it is right now i don't know christine is it is it 150 for the first car and i forget how much it is for the second car All right and then the second car if you, i think it's only 25 dollars for the second but you can't keep going after that you, I, you we made a, I don't know if it's two or three but there is a maximum you can't do it for like six cars but I don't think that adding resident or changing it would change much of your inner downtown because that's all green zone, which is really two hours. Yeah. Yeah, I'm mean, look, I, I guess it's my view. I mean, I'm just trying to think that we've got a lot of, uh, got a lot of commentary that should try to make it less complicated for people to to go downtown that's so that's why i was thinking drop dropping it may be more to me makes more sense than um than keeping it where it is are we moving to the next topic or are we going to address the public that has joined us um yeah why don't we open it up to comments. I think we have Vanessa and a, and a 781 number. So Vanessa, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Do we have to open up? Thank you. Mic? Hi, good evening. Vanessa Alvarado, Mount Vernon Street. Um, I have a question on the map. Um, what is the, what do the double gray lines mean? Unregulated? That is unregulated areas. Okay, thank you. Um, so that means that 
I know there had been a previous discussion about making parts of Sanborn Street um, parking only on one side. Has that been taken off the table? That was originally for Linden Street. Sanborn was going to stay the same, and they we've decided to keep both streets unregulated. So it's however it is now is how it's going to stay, or that's our plan. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And Vanessa, just so you know, part of the reason we didn't want to limit it to one side is that the parking on the, the sort of higgledy piggledy actually is a um, traffic calming, you know, byproduct of that is a traffic calming initiative. So it actually helps people go a little slower on those roads. FYI. That's great. Thank you so much. See anybody else from the community? Um, so I guess the only other is, is, so if we were to propose a hundred dollar uh, um, employee, I'm sorry, resident. Uh, any any strong objections? I don't. I didn't think we were talking about resident stickers. We're only talking about employee sticker prices. Yeah, I don't think we should change resident. My proposal is leave resident at 150, have employee at 150, maintain the existing regulation mm -hmm. that if you have frontage, you get it for free if you march down and apply for it. Right. You know, and I think all I'm saying is I propose that the resident go from 150 to 1 100. And because that, you know, I mean that's part of what we're propose as part of our recommendations. Anybody does anybody find that anybody in favor of of that? I, I object to it. I don't think it's part of our-, our Yeah, we, we, I heard all these- I'm curious if anybody else has a, if anybody else would support a lowering of the resident on the theory that you've already got residents support the community in many ways and- Sorry, Jay, what did you say? I just agreed to that objection. I seconded that. What Karen said, I, I think it should stay the same. Residents should stay the same. That's what it is. It's not really. Yeah, I think 100, 150 is fine. I think someone mentioned what other um, areas cost more money, so we're actually one of the less least expensive. Any other comments? Very well. Should we talk about overnight parking? Yes, it'll be a blast. So I will just start out if I can to let you know that our staff is meeting on it tomorrow and the DPW has very strong feelings about it. So Bob has really asked us to come up with an answer for the select bond. I mean, please feel your opinion, but the staff is meeting about it tomorrow. I think we're happy. Yeah, because it, because it, is a, it is a whole um, town issue. It's not just downtown parking. Mm -hmm. And I did bring it, I brought it up at the select board meeting about potentially having it on the next agenda, meaning next Tuesday, only because if we don't, I mean, the winter is going to be over with and then, you know, it is what it is. So that's where we're at with that. So Christine would have to give her input on, on what she feels, same thing with us. So it's a potential, I'm not saying it's guaranteed. So I just brought it up and that's where we're at. Christine, do you want to give us any preview of what you're thinking? Well, I just know that the DPW director, they are really um, understaffed right now. Parking and snow removal is very tough on them. Um, we have seen in the past that giving certain lots by 6 a.m. has not worked for us. 6 a.m. like doesn't mean anything. We don't know what time the snow is coming, when it's leaving. I have I have a lot of uh, email from the senior center over the years that cars park there all night when we used to allow it, and they don't move. So I go down there to find these homeowners. So I just think we we can't assume that people will move if we make that regulation. Um, and they can't all either worry about getting them out of a certain time to move their cars either. So I know the DPW director has a lot to say on it. Um, so we can't expect them that they can get anything plowed in a certain time. You know, they have certain areas they have to hit first. Christine, would um, one thing that we actually never did talk about as a potential for, for this is the double secret MBTA lot spots down on Ash Street. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for her. We'll have to talk to Jane. I think that's something like that where, and we don't have to get you out of there. And it's right, because nobody you. cares. So it's like, fine, right. go park there. Yeah, I think that area is fine. That, that really wouldn't really impact, I don't think, the DPW. I can, well, I can uh, relay that tomorrow morning um, in the meeting and offer that. And then the other question is, in, in non-snow times, um, do you have a view about just overnight parking in general? Like if people- Yeah, I mean, I, my only, I have just two issues is that cars don't move and we're giving out these other passes in the downtown to start employee. I just, I want to make sure that it rotates and that, you know, that if they are allowed to park there all night, they leave in the morning. Um, and we just haven't seen that happen in the past. Um, so that's my only concern with if, if they can do it all the time. Bernie, sorry, Bernie, go ahead. No, you, you go ahead, Chris. Uh, could you bring up maybe Christine just to to see maybe Vine Street being an overnight slash snow parking area on those, you know, it's obviously far away from where these people are going to want to be, but if it is, if that area doesn't have to be plowed or well, I don't know what the deal is, the 42 with the orange thing. If maybe those upper spots, maybe we make 10, 15 of them overnight slash snow kind of thing, if that's going to cause an issue, maybe Jane says it's a massive problem and then it is what it is. But I think that that's far enough. It's lit over there, et cetera. Um, it, it, it's better than nothing currently. So. Yeah, the only thing too, though, we do have people on the other side of town, like near the police station, Pleasant Street, where they have couple yeah. of double family homes and such that uh I think that goes to uh Liz's point about that other spot so that's kind yeah. of the, the twofer I yep. it's I mean maybe they have other ideas on on where because then because we couldn't use Sanborn Street I think or whatever was mentioned last time yeah uh, I know we really don't want to leave it on this a street correct yeah so maybe those spots over there um on Vine Street right at, at the upper spot I don't it just bring it up and they know better than I do. So yeah, I would say as long as it's not something they have to worry about during snow, you know, and that we're not taking yeah. up other people's faces in the daytime if they don't move. That's all. So I have an idea that I wanted to run by everybody. And um I I emailed Julie about it briefly. And so my my thought was that overnight parking and excess parking for downtown by the Brandy Street lot is very complicated. And my idea was the Brandy Street lot perhaps become an overnight parking lot where you charge them a flat fee since there'll be kiosks there anyway. And this would be all year round. And during the snow issues, um, because the the commuter rail is plowed very, very early because supposedly people get there early that the re restriction be you can park in the lot overnight, you have to be out by six in the morning, but all of them would be required to get Reading resident stickers and then they could move their cars at six to the train and then park from six to 10 or whatever it is. And then because the Brandy Street lot would then clear out at six, it would give the DPW an opportunity to plow that lot off plow the lot at six and everyone would have moved out of the lot into the places that are already plowed. So I, I thought not only would the kiosk serve as earning money, it would provide overnight parking for all the residents down there or other people that need overnight parking. And it's, it's a lot that's not used late in the day or in the evening or overnight. So I guess I wanted to hear other people's opinion on that kind of a plan and Christine, if that's even doable. Again, I just wouldn't make any plan where you expect people are going to leave at a certain time. They have not done it in the past with anything I've seen. They will let their car sit there buried in snow, getting ticket after ticket. So that would be my only problem with that one is that they're not going to leave at 6 a.m. or half of them won't. Um, that would be the only thing I'd be worried about. So then now the people that you wanted to come downtown and use, you know, the parking lot. So when you, when you had to tow people out of the Pleasant Street lot, uh, were you able to tow them or is that a, a so when it was only and this is uh 2018 and 19 
we didn't have all this downtown yet. So I was only dealing with a lot of people in the senior center a lot, um, not necessarily, we didn't have issues down here yet. Uh, so I first tried to knock on all their doors and find them, you know, I don't want to tow someone's car, like, it, it, but uh, we wouldn't be able to tow more than like five to 10 cars. Our towing company just wouldn't be able to handle that. Um, and, and it ties up a lot of officers and what we have noticed down in that area is that a lot of people don't um, re-register their car to Reading, so it would be hard to find some of these owners as well that are just moving in in apartments and condos. Mm. So right. It, it's tougher yeah. than I know. Yeah. Um, it seems easy, but it has been tough when we just had even a small lot that was available. Someday if we get a garage, that's a great use for a garage is snow parking. I, I like I like I what you're doing, Sarah. I like it. I think that's really the only. The more I think about it, the more I because you can't. And the problem is that any in any given snowstorm, I mean, you could have eight inches of snow by three a.m., and then you have to get plows in there. Not only plows, but in some cases, front loaders to move the snow into big piles. And there's no way you could have cars parked in any lot unless it was a covered lot, right? If it was a covered lot and it wasn't filling up with snow, then you then this is a viable option. But any other option where you're trying to get people off the streets into a lot, you gotta plow the lot. And so there's no possible way you can get, you can use a lot for snow when the snow is on the lot. It just, it's a circular problem. I guess that's why the Vine Street thing works, you know what I mean? Because you're plowing uh, down Vine Street and then the people are in these spots and they're just backing out into stuff that was already plowed. Like, so you're, you know, it's it seems like a, a good alternative, but I, I'm not at the DPW, so I don't, maybe what I'm saying, you know, isn't well, correct. Problem, yeah, the problem with that though, Chris, is that to Christine's point is those spots are what we're then counting on for employee parking during the day. So if people oh, are, yeah, I, whereas, I, I mean, I, I agree with you conceptually. And that's why I was talking about the double secret Ash street parking. That is nothing and no one. And so there's no expectation that it's going to be plowed. How so many, you, where is that? How many spots is the orange fluorescent on the, on the right-hand side? No, how no, no. It's way down. It's like the, the oh, yeah, yeah, back yeah, yeah, way yeah. into uh, the back way into um, right in, um, Walgreens, isn't it? Well, no, no, like into Market Basket, like over past by McDonald's. Isn't it like ten spots though, or something like that? I don't yeah, think that. It's not many spots. It's just for clarification. It's called Goodall Sanford Road, and I think it's about twenty-five spaces. Oh, all right. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a pretty big thing, but again, nobody is counting on it, mm -hmm. and so if people are like. On, in a snow emergency, if they're not making arrangements to go to another town or to somebody else's garage or whatever, and it's like, then you can go here and understand that you're gonna have to shovel yourself out the next day because nobody's coming to plow. Unless you, unless you, the problem is that it snows at, you know, in the afternoon and you've got eight inches of snow on that, those spaces and you can't get in there anyway. Well, then you shovel yourself in just like you would in the city, yeah. right? Yeah. If you want to, if you want to have a spot, I mean, that's, here's your alternative there I it mean, is it's right there yeah but i mean I, I guess i keep coming back to the idea that i think part of this is just going to have to be covered parking somewhere there's no someday, other way Marty. someday yeah there's well, bike for the for the short term i mean as we've discussed it's going to take five to ten years or however long to do that so if we're trying to accommodate the overnight parking or overflow parking or snow parking, that's not going to solve anything right now. I think the even other thing the, is too, go ahead, Bernie. Even the postmark, I mean, they have some that are covered spaces, but then they have some that are not covered. I think there are 21 that are not. So even there, they sort of have to get out of there for somebody to be plowing it. Well, that's and true then, for anybody. Uh, that's true in my yeah. own driveway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I wonder, is there enough if there's 25 spots here, how many was Postmark again that had to park in their $50 parking lot? Was it 31 or am I making that number up? How many people were, just Postmark alone, how many were parking? Was it 31? It was in the minutes, I guess I should have. Well, there were that many people, they were, they were saying that they had that many extra spaces that they hoped for. They weren't all 
they weren't all paying to park in that other lot. Right now, they've been winging 50, it. 52 uh, cars, and they had 38 spots to uh, to park in. So 52. Right, so 13 extra. Yeah, so 13, and 13, we got 14. 25 here. I mean, that ratio fits if it's, you know. And again, this is just for the snow. I mean, if, you know, yeah, the yeah. thing that if these other lots are options for just the, you know, 350 days of the year when it isn't a problem, if we if we give that, and again, I know Christine, this is this is your your world and not ours, but it's like if you provide that option for most of the rest of the year, that's already being that's that's a nice win for folks who didn't plan or who are looking for visitor parking. Right. We just, so, yeah. I mean, like me and the chief will have to just think the whole town. What do they get if, if their driveway doesn't fit their kids and stuff? But I guess they would have to get a ride down here. Yeah. Um, that's just the only thing. We do have to remember this is like a town wide thing. Um, yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, Christine, I'll say, like, I have a, I have a driver now who may be getting a car within the next however many months. And if that car doesn't fit on the driveway, that is not the problem of the town of Reading. That is the problem of the Whitelam household. <laughs> Right. You don't have to solve that. Yeah. For me. That's, right. That no, and, you know, problem. I mean, I, mean yeah. I, you know, we like, there's a few towns that have a blue light throughout their downtown. And when it's on, that means no overnight parking. Like we would love for that, something like that to work so that our residents didn't have to worry about this so much. I mean, last year we did it by just posting on Facebook. So unfortunately, if you didn't yeah. check that, because we don't want to send a code red every time. Cause that's like overuse of it. So I think just notifying them to when, but. Yeah, so that, right, the difficulty in something like that, right, is that often those towns, there, there is a commercial opportunity, right? You go park in a garage somewhere or a lot, you know, there's some some place where you can go pay to get off the street. Um, I, and we just don't have that in Reading. Like, we actually outlaw it, right? Um, so, right, I, I know at one point, Right, someone wanted to open up a commercial lot, and that was, you know, no go. So, r r I think right, we need, we need to sort of get that into into context. Is like, what is what what is the opportunity? You town, or you park in someone's yard, or I don't know. But I guess for this meeting, right, this uh, I the couple of suggestions were good, but we really can't advance this until after. Um, after that bigger conversation is had about the town-wide policy, right? So I'm, uh, great suggestions, but I, I don't think we're going to come to an answer here, right? No, I think you should come with suggestions that me and Julie and Andrew will bring to our staff meeting tomorrow. Yep. So we will, I will relay everything that everybody has said so far. And see, I mean, it's really, this is a really big DPW issue. We have to get out there and help them, but it's really there maybe so we email you christine if we think of something later on i'm oh, sure tonight. that's at 8 30 tomorrow morning so oh, okay <laughs> so we're suggesting that we try to that our recommendation is to tr attempt to find uh, overnight parking in municipal lots during snow emergencies otherwise um if if parking overnight was liberalized, that um, it would allow people to park in unrestricted areas or um, resident only sp spaces. Is that what kind of a recommendation are you looking uh, for? Uh, uh, looking for from us, I, Bernie? I think we were talking the other way around. That we say in non-snow times, people could park in designated lots overnight, and in snow times. This is the, yeah. the unsolvable well, issue. That's yeah. That's it. That's the issue. Well, there, right. There's the two two opportunities that were brought up that were not lots, but still parking, uh, off street, sort of off street parking. Yeah. Right. The the Vine Street and and uh, <laughs> whatever the name of that street is down by um, uh, towards Market Basket. And are we talking about any uh, municipal? Uh, be able to park in municipal lots like the town hall lot or not during um, snow not during not, snow. I'm, not, I'm not talking about snow i'm talking about 
non-snow, non-declared emergencies. Yeah, I mean, I think based on our conversation last time and a little bit tonight, we were saying that if the town hall lot and the uh, parking by the and the parking by the train weren't those any unrestricted, the All right? So any unregulated, or even I suppose even the regulated, because as regulated, yeah, the lots all have some sort of regulation, right? But the but even the regulated, the two to four, isn't that up to like six p.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it doesn't matter what the eight to eight to six regs are. We're talking about just the overnight situation. Right. So in theory, it could be any municipal lot or or any place else for that matter. If the if the restriction on overnight parking is removed, then pretty much they can park anywhere. Like it, it sounds like what the issue is, except in a snow emergency, we've got to figure out um, what hap you know what people's options are. So are, are you opposed to having overnight parking in the Brandy Street lot and charging a flat fee? No, I think it's, it's certainly an option. I don't see a problem I mean, with that. If the residents are already paying 50 bucks a month for the lot behind them and they're you know, afraid that the owner of the lot is gonna kick them out for whatever reason, I think that it would be a great use of the kiosk and we'd earn money for spaces that are empty most of the time. So I would much rather see all the overnight parking in, a, that's one option to have people pay to park there a flat fee per month or whatever. And then if there's another lot in another part of town um, that doesn't necessarily have a kiosk, but has the ability to do that when it's done snow, I would much rather see that than have it on the street. I, Karen, I think that's a great idea. And why not use the other kiosk lot if we're using it in the same in the same way? You have to be out by six or eight in the morning. Then it, it would. Yeah, they wouldn't either place though, right? Right. I guess the only other question is whether whether the the nighttime establishments um, there whether their customers would um, would have an issue with that. I don't. I don't know. You you guys are operating businesses down there. Yeah, that's a good point, Bernie. I know Venetian definitely has a brisk trade of, of an evening using that CVS lot. But they, but but in, they in, in, general, point. in general, there's other places to park in, in downtown. I mean, sure. right, they use the CVS lot, but there's plenty of, of on-street parking at night. Sure. Right, they, we don't need to solve so. a nighttime parking. A, a, parking issue during the you know those evening hours right that's not that hasn't ever been identified as an issue yeah that that was my question to the people who are more familiar with the overnight uh, the the nighttime i mean i i've never had problems parking at night downtown so i can't imagine it'll be i'm just trying to think of of all the issues that could i mean i, I and again i i like the i like this idea but as we were talking through it I actually have had some problems going to Bunratty or Venetian, not, you know, not insurmountable. Again, if you park far enough away and, and walk, when we add in the restaurant at Postmark, it's a, whatever it's, uh, so I don't, I don't think there is a downtown evening parking problem. I'll put it this way. I hope we get enough fabulous restaurants that there yeah. is one eventually. <laughs> right. It's probably right. It's probably a Friday or Saturday night in the summer. Yeah. Nice night kind of an issue. And like you said, that would be good, right? That'd be good. And <laughs> if, then we can all just walk farther, point. enjoy yeah. the evening walk. Yeah. Yeah, the niche and moon doesn't open for lunch because of the parking issue, but they're open for dinner. So like it, it, the, the, there's no real parking issue at, at nighttime over there. That's like reasonable, like during the day. Yeah. Get a, so. Yeah, you're right. Fair enough. Just out of curiosity, since um, the parking is being enforced now in the Brandy Court and CVS lot, is there any um, any data or anecdotal evidence that uh, that we can talk to that has those have those lots been freed up? I think Tom suggested that it was getting a lot more free than what it was prior to the enforcement. Um, I don't have any now, but we can start working on it by our next meeting. That'd be that would be helpful. I think I've been wondering about that, and I just. Mm -hmm. 
So we um, does um, does our discussion here does it come into a recommendation or at least uh, we can communicate our thoughts that the uh, the kiosk lots uh, are available for overnight plus virtually any other space around town as long as the uh, the enforcement takes place uh, so that if somebody has to be out by eight and they're still there and it's marked as you know two hour parking after eight that they uh, you know they wind up risking getting a ticket is that um yeah i guess my only question to present this tomorrow are you guys also so are they paying these lots they have to buy a residence ticket you said so this wouldn't change the rest of the town for the every other night of the year or does it for the winter well, i guess month? i guess if, if you're i guess the point is that if you're right if if the recommendation is to eliminate the parking regulation, which bans overnight parking in all of Reading, if you take that off, that means everybody in Reading can park overnight on any street, including the downtown. And um, and the people downtown who live there, but they but th there are not parking spaces designed into their building. Those are the people that we're really focusing on, and they could either use the kiosk lots or any other street in Reading because. Once the overnight parking ban has been removed, they could park anywhere, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. Then they can just stay on Sanford Street all night, right? Why would yeah, we have? Can. Why would we have them use the kiosk? They wouldn't have to. I so wouldn't. Th that's their choice, right? They might want to. I, I wouldn't be pulling an overnight parking ban just in general, unless they're in designated spots during the winter, only because these streets are a mess. Like, I remember seeing. Yeah, obviously last winter just people parking all and i'm like how are people going to plow with no, I'm all talking about cars just in a, littered in all declared, over sorry let me be let me be more clear you you take off the regulation that said that bans overnight parking in reading subject to a declared emergency which could be not just snow it could be any emergency and then they have to get off the street overnight in the entire town right it's going to no. come down where they wouldn't be able to tow all those people there's going to be hundreds of people that never move easily if we went ahead and did that well that's that's what i'm trying to understand that's what yeah. that's what we're trying to, i think you have to park well, in, what's the, in parking in a designated location for any of these overnight people whether it's snow whether it isn't snow they need to have a designated spot to go Everything else stays the same for the rest of the town, however long it's been. Other than if you want to live at Postmark, you're going to go over where Rite Aid is and call it a day. Mm. Otherwise, you get the ticket. No, no, no. Right. Let's put this in pers into perspective. So, so one of the things that um, that is being discussed is is whether someone on West Street, or maybe that's a bad example, right? Someone on Summer Street can can park there overnight, or or not. Um, again, probably not the best example, but you know it, it has nothing to do with downtown, right? As um, as Christine said, right? It's a the the third kid. You know, you have a you have a car, and whether they can park on the street or not. So there's an issue that's much bigger than these couple of buildings that needs to be addressed. So, and I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't want right town policy to be dictated, right? There's 25,000 people that live in town to, to be dictated by these, these, you know, three or four buildings. I, I think there's right. There's the, for, for a very long time, right. There has been a uh, November one to, to April one. Is that right? Um, uh, ban on, on, parking overnight um, aside from the past year and so this notion that suddenly if that you know if that um, changes that um, that there's going to be all these like all this chaos like uh, people figured it out during the summer months right <laughs> like there there wasn't chaos in June when they were allowed to park it in uh, overnight. I think the real issue here that we need to address is 
what happens in snow events, right? Because the rest of the policy is a policy that needs to be dealt with townwide. But what happens in snow events is particularly an issue in downtown, more so than it is in in other parts of the uh, other parts of town. And right, I I think right, we don't want to overstretch and sort of conflate different issues together. No, I think what I was saying is that there's a regulation on the books, it's regulation 5.9, whatever, I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but all that says is that in the entire town, there's a ban on overnight parking, but the, the town chooses not to enforce that regulation during those dates that you talked about, yeah. right? And so now we're talking about, so that's what I was, that's what I was asking. So we could either eliminate that regulation, which would allow everybody to park anywhere in town overnight, except in the case of a declared emergency. Or you could keep the regulation in place, but I think what people, what, what, what other alternative would be that in, in certain places of town, downtown could be one of those, you could designate certain spaces that otherwise are regulated to be um, a lot overnight parking allowed in certain places. Some of those could be kiosk lots, they could be Vine Street, mm -hmm. they could be any number of places. So you'd sort of have to, it's the, it's the, uh, the complement set of um, allowing no parking. So no parking yep. anytime except in these lots or uh, overnight parking everywhere except in a snow emergency or some other emergency. Yes. Those are, I think, the, at I, least two choices. I'm sure there are more. I'm sure there are more. Well said. So I get to, do people have any, I mean, is this, is maybe that our, is that our regular recommendation? To the PTTF is that those are the two options or yeah but I, I guess I'm thinking right we those are two recommendations but there's a townwide issue that needs to be sort of uh, uh, addressed too and so depending on which way it goes right then then the our recommendation changes yeah for me I'm, I'm fine with keeping everything the way that it's been forever and just designating snow slash overnight being the same location for wherever it ends up being. I mean, it, this way here, it's consistent. It's you want to park here in June overnight, you park there. You want to park because it snowed in July. Congratulations, you're parking in the same spot. That's just, mm -hmm. just keep it consistent. It's, it's, it is what it is. And we would continue to not enforce the overnight parking ban in non-winter months. Is that... Yes, whatever, however long it's been, whatever it is, just keep it consistent. And the, and the only other comment we got from some of the people who were concerned about this is that they said, look, all the other towns don't have this ban. Why does Reading, I mean, is that a true statement? No, because the documents we read is that all the other towns don't have the parking ban. No, they, they had a during the year. Sir, by any means. Yeah, okay. That's good information for us to know, though. Yeah, I think it's very helpful. But yeah, I think it's so. Yeah, so I mean, I, and I think it just points to the other issue that maybe a covered parking, garage parking, is becoming an increased need, and the more development you have downtown, the bigger the problem is going to get. And who knows? Because they they don't come to these meetings and talk about it, but they just deal with it. So. Um... And and there's parking issues up on. Um... Uh, Reading, what's the one up off of West Street? Johnson Woods. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So Christine, where do those, what, what, what's your experience with all those? I don't have any overnight parking ish, um, history with any of those. They're all private ways. So whatever they do, I have no idea. So we don't have to help them like in their areas and they've never asked for parking anywhere from us. Because I always thought that they all, there was sufficient parking in those developments. For I assume so too. Yep. Nope. We, not on, not covered. 
not covered. Not covered, so, but I'm oh, talking not about, covered, but no, okay. outside. Right, but I'm saying like during the snow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody who is about... parking outside has to go away. I don't sure. know where they go. Yeah, no, I understand that. I just uh, my question was was not about that. It was about is there a, in total adequate number of parking yeah. for those units? CPDC does hear it from Johnson Woods that um, about visitor parking and about um, uh, them, but uh, residents buying additional cars and not having anywhere for them to put. Uh, um, park. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Johnson Woods is a, I mean, as some, just making deliveries from the bookstore, just having to park for a minute, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So glad we're not trying to solve that problem here. <laughs> there is no solution. <laughs> glad you guys aren't trying to solve that problem. <laughs> right. Sorry, John. <laughs> just put a key yeah, on you know, Those there. are always fun meetings. That'll be that. Right, Julie? Right. I mean, I guess like you take Johnson Woods as an example of a problem that you don't want to solve, we could just make all. So Christine, do you have enough information from us that you have uh, material to go back to the meeting with tomorrow? Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I wrote down every exam, um, so sorry, suggestion that you've given and you kind of have come up with two major ones. And I think that's all of our issue. Do we, you know, two major decisions here to put forward. So um are we going to discuss where the funds uh for any of this can go um is that a discussion that's part of our purview separate committee for that i thought that that was going to be oh. some, not a separate committee but there's restrictions on what the money can be used for it's in separate fund aligning so right. I'll just, if, you're, if you're talking about a parking benefit district there's legislation there needs to be some entity that oversees and decides like businesses and also town, certain town staff on it to be like a direct connection between decision making and town hall. Um, also, people that understand how like the the finances of the money can go to all different things across town. Um, instead of just the downtown and like an argument could be made that since people who live all around town and even in other towns will be using the downtown and paying I wanted to just make a general recommendation that you were at some point maybe not tonight right that you're supportive of the idea of having the revenue for parking as well so that i don't think that, that was included before though that's going right. towards something already i think like some of that revenue might be needed to stabilize the police department budget but i obviously christine mm -hmm. can answer that better than i can um, I, I asked the chief that earlier. He said right now, all he knows, it goes into the general fund. So it doesn't necessarily line up to anything for us. Okay. Um, so this, can you all see the kiosk document? Yep. Okay. So it hasn't changed that much from what I showed last time. Um, the, I guess the big thing, and I think I noted it in my email, is that for some reason I thought the handheld devices were a lot more expensive than the the quotes that we saw. Um, and so I asked um, as a handhold, only one of the vendors that um, has a contract through MAPC uh, offers it as part of their contract and it's the Ventec vendor. Um, and this was the price that they had it listed as. Um, I would, we would obviously wanna see if that's a real number across different vendors, if, if we can find, I, I forget, did you get a handheld quote from Passport, Christine? They didn't the, break it down. They've made it in packages. So I don't know that one alone. Okay. Um, but yeah, we could look into that a little bit more. But but anyway, if this is a real accurate. Can you zoom in just a little bit? Sorry. Sure. Sorry. Thanks. It's it's hard for me to see too. So it's um, helpful. What is going on? Sorry. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. Um, Oh, I'm stepping on my keyboard. That's why it's not working. Um, okay, so, oh goodness. The, um, you might've seen earlier today, I sent you some like documents that we got from Andover and Waltham. There's, there are four different types of documents. Um, that was the information they, they would give us. And I, I didn't look through them in like great detail, but I did skim through them and I didn't see anything that jumped out that was like something we hadn't, thought of I mean there's obviously there's things we haven't thought of like completely right or fully but they're, they're most of the stuff that I saw was like stuff that was like okay I saw that in other places I factored that in here in some way um 
one thing that that we talked about a little bit, but maybe you need to talk about a little bit more is like a system like this and like requires staff and depending on how many kiosks and how many handholds and how much regular like paid parking we have, like that could be a, how much of a full-time job or multiple full-time jobs that is to manage um, is something we would probably want to make sure we can we could staff and and um, not overwhelm like our existing systems. But so yeah, so this document hasn't really changed that much. I, I did also provide a document with feedback from Waltham uh, Arlington and I added our Andover conversation into it. And I'm happy to screen share that too, if that's of interest. I thought that document was extremely oh, helpful. Yeah. Absolutely, Liz. I mean, reading that, I, I wanted to head for the hills. So I definitely think it's worth it because when you look at here and you saw Ventec was 98,000 and everyone else is like a little bit lower and all that, it's like, yeah, you know, maybe we'll go with the middle. Like reading that stuff is just like, uh-uh. Like people are driving from New York for a thousand bucks, like a pop, no thank you. Like, it's just crazy what they're dealing with over there. So definitely, if you want to bring it up, Liz, I think it's worth everyone seeing, like the trials and tribulations that if Reading was any one of these lists on here, it, it, would, it would be a massive failure, other than it, towards the end when it gets to the Ventec thing where it seems like that is hashing itself out. So <laughs> I will say, Chris, like my, my perspective when I said I found this document useful was more from a positive spin of like that kiosk seemed to be a very effective device in these towns. And yes, we need to be mindful of maintenance costs. But my my takeaway from this was more like, okay, yeah, this is this is useful. So just oh, yeah. Be... No, it's yeah, it's when it gets into the, like I said, the thousand bucks, someone only one person drives from New York to service this thing. Like yeah, I I how can you operate a business like that? Yeah, that's not if someone one one of the other vendors doesn't reply or something like that too. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it just seems wild to me. Yeah, it's not on here. I think it was like further yeah. down. We can go over. Uh, if, I'll stop talking and let Julie take No, care. that's okay. I don't know if I want, need to like read this. If you all got a chance to look at it, or if I should just go through it really quick. Like, what, what's your preference? I apologize. I didn't have a chance to read through all this stuff. So any highlights that you can point out would be helpful. Sure. Yeah. So um, the three towns that I spoke to and two of them I spoke to like almost two years ago and then um, Andover, Christine and I and um, some other people from the Reading Police uh, Department met with them last week. Um, basically, they've all had paid parking. Um, well, two of them have had paid parking for a bunch of decades and then Arlington has had it fairly recently. Um, they have different pricing schemes and different apps and different ways of paying like they pay by plate pay by space pay by uh part a pain display right so they all have kind of different things but they the i think the big takeaway was like a lot of the feedback kind of led me down a similar path right even though all three communities had different experiences and different use different types of technologies they've all kind of circled around this idea that um having um like a pay by plate system like the kiosk system is worth it um that like regulating parking via pricing versus enforcement is is a seems like a good strategy um and then you know getting into the nitty-gritty like the the ventec kind of rose to the top as one that was recommended and um also that was the one recommended by our consultant um having different ways for people to be able to pay the, the solar versus hard also seems like it's working in some of the communities um pay by plate like where you plug in your license plate um is the easy, most user friendly and it also works well with a lot of the apps right because you just have your information stored in the app and you just press a couple buttons and you're good to go um so So basically, um, I'm going slowly in case any of you are reading this while I'm talking. Um, but the the pricing, um, so like Andover doesn't have a free period, and they just do a dollar an hour. 
um, that seems to be working for them. Right now, they did say they're going to increase that because they're re they're renovating all their lots this spring, um, so that amount will go up. Waltham mentioned that they charge too little, and they're looking at increasing their pricing. Um, so just this is kind of like the overview lay of the land in each community. Um, Andover made an interesting comment that like because they've had paid parking for so long, um, when they switched from like the individual space meters to, to multi-space kiosks, like residents were like happy and because it's easier to use and that they don't really get complaints from the users of the residents because the, they're used to paying and they expect to pay and they understand the logic behind why they pay to park where they're parking. Um, so I think there is like a learning curve and a getting used to and an adjustment um, and then like with anything. So like again, Chris sort of mentioned this, like the vendors, um, uh, basically like the, there is some different, since some of the towns had systems in the past and then like renovated or redid or rethought them, they've had experiences with multiple vendors. So for example, like Parkion was the one that, um, the guy comes from New York and charges a thousand dollars and that jives with actually the document they the pricing proposal they gave MAPC it was like 950 bucks a day if you want someone to come service your parking on kiosk um but so like Waltham used to have them but moved away from them towards Ventec because they weren't happy with their experience and then Andover only has parking on now because they wanted Ventec but Ventec at the time they were looking to purchase them didn't have a mobile app and so that was uh, about five years ago when they were looking at at that. Um, and, but they said definitely go with Ventec, especially if if they have a mobile app now because they seem like the best vendor. And obviously, when if, if and when we get to this point, we'll we'll do some more vetting and we'll try to meet with the different and companies and see if we really think that all of this checks out and would be right for Reading. But um, so far, that seems like the direction we're being pointed in. Um, And then the type, like there's three different types, pay and display where you pay at the kiosk, you get a little ticket, you have to go back to your car to put it in your windshield. Um, there's pay by space where you pull into a parking space that has a number if, or has a sign that hopefully has a sign with the number, not like you're driving on top of it, um, but I've seen that. And you have to remember what the number is um, when you go to the kiosk and then you plug it in and then you come back. And so mobile apps help manage all of these different scenarios better, but like, it, you know, um, in theory, you could end up walking back and forth to your car. Um, and then the pay by plate where you've got your, like you pl either plug in your license plate into the kiosk or you plug it into your app and your phone. Um, and you, you don't have to, you don't even have to interface with the kiosk if you don't want to, um, but you definitely don't have to go to the kiosk and then go back to your car. So they all circled around that. Like some of them that don't have pay by plate mentioned they wish they had it because it would be a way more user-friendly option. Um, and then payment methods, they all have like all the options. Um, so, and depending on the kiosk, like there were issues with different, some of them like with the um, card getting stuck or um, like, I guess Waltham doesn't give change. Um, so just things like that, we would wanna try to understand better and, and prevent against as much as possible. Um, and then the mobile apps, um, pay by phone is the one MBTA uses and a lot of, um, communities use, um, and then Andover has Passport. So, and again, like I looked at this, that typically the contract fees um, get passed through to the end user. Uh, they're pretty nominal. And there, there might be like a startup fee uh, or an initiation fee, um, but also fairly nominal that the town would pay. Enforcement devices, I added this section, it's a little bit thin because I like this isn't really my area of expertise and I didn't, we didn't get that much, didn't have time to get that into it. Um, but, and Christine, if any of this isn't what you remember, please <laughs> say, clarify it or correct it. But um, 
I think Andover was working with vehicle mounted license plate recognition technology and handheld license plate recognition technology. And they mentioned that the technology is great when it works, but they definitely have like issues making uh, it's glitchy and doesn't always work. Um, and that it it requires a lot of staff time to like keep it working. So that's just one of those like things to think about, like the staff time that needs to go into the system to make it work. Um, they all, Andover also has like, I think they have 16 multi-space uh, meters. They have over 400 spaces. Um, so that they have maybe, you know, a lot more that they're dealing with than we would. And one thing they mentioned is that it's important to have a policy for how you're going to collect data and protect privacy when you're dealing with license plate recognition. And then also, I think like the pay by plate, I know that came up when we were presenting to the select board, there were concerns about like how much information you can get from someone through their like end system and whether it can be um, like readily, easily linked to someone's like private information. Um, and so I have other another document that kind of outlines some answers to those concerns, but then Andover um, just came right out and said, have a policy for how you're going to deal with this. It's really important. Um, and they offered to share their policy with us. So we'd have like a template to look at. Um, I don't think they sent it yet, though. At least I didn't Julie, we already so we do have an LPR policy already, and we, we definitely have a start of what we would need. Great. Depending on what we end up doing. Great. Um, and then with the parking benefit district, Arlington is the only one of the three towns that has that has it and they had some like like real lessons learned um, that are kind of outlined here in some some stuff happening so. Um, I don't know if that's exactly linked to that money or if it's linked to other money, but it seems like it could be. Um, and then just some takeaways like. They're, the three towns across the board seem like really happy with um, managing their parking in, in this way. Um, and at least a couple of them mentioned like more revenue than they had anticipated. Um, it wasn't like the reason they did it, but it has ended up being one of those like uh, positive things that has come from it. So. Um, Yeah, just a lot of good feedback. Thanks for compiling that. That was very helpful. So as far as this, um, I, I guess there are any questions about, so you've given us some estimates. It's not 100% baked. $100,000 is about what it looks like your, your, um, uh, your number is at the top of this document. That's right. Yeah, so this kiosk document, I mean. Yeah, that's. I thought last week you said that we should really change the contingency to closer to 30 or 35, just based on how things are going. So if we were, when we're going to ask town meeting, we were going to up it a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't change the contingency, um, but I certainly could. You brought it down from what was originally suggested. Yeah, Ryan, town engineer, had suggested 30. Uh, and then John had suggested 35. And I put 25. Um, so I'm happy to defer to experts who deal with these contingency things all the time. And if you agree, it should be 30. So 30? Yeah, I'm just trying to find my spreadsheet. I'll just quickly give you a number on that. So I guess my, I guess the point that we're trying to do it on this, um, you would like us to um, vote to request for April town meeting. And of course, it's not really from us. It really, we recommend to PTTF, I guess PTTF recommends to somebody and then somebody puts this in the budget. Is that the way it normally goes? Yeah, so, you know, like the warrant will close on March 1st and this can be a placeholder and we can work out the details of 
like you going to the select board, them agreeing hopefully with like your recommendations. And then um, like if we had have this on the warrant as a placeholder request, once it goes to town meeting, it can be, it can stay and it can be supported. And we can say that here are the reasons, here's the information, um, park, supports it, select board supports it, how, what, however we need to do it. Um, so, but for right now, before all those pieces are, you know, have played out, we, it'll be, it would be a placeholder request um, in the budget. So I guess we're just waiting to, to have a number with yeah. a 30% contingency. I think it's like 10. 10, the total overall number would be 102, 199 or something like that, because it's, 5% extra of 80,000 is 4,000. So you're at 24,000. So that's, yeah. So it's like 102 something for the Ventec anyway. Yeah. yeah 102, 207. So yeah, I'm good at math. You are. And you're, you're basically, we're, we're, we're leaning toward Ventec. That's decision number one. Decision number two is probably should have like $110,000, which would cover the 30% plus a little bit more. Yeah, when I see 102 for me, uh, 98 is better than than obviously 102. But if I saw 102 and it was 110, I think the same thing. It's 110 yeah. essentially. Yeah. So. That's the way I think about yeah. it. The, yeah, and that's you, just the way that. Any other views on that? You know, I, mean, I guess what we're working toward is having a motion to. Julie, I uh, guess I don't know if this mat would matter, but I think we would want at least two handheld devices for backup or for overnight parking or anything else we could use it for parking. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, so that fits into the 110 anyway. That comes into the 110, yeah. Let's do four. Yeah. So 110, I mean, I don't think that, that anybody have other that, thoughts that it should be more or less? That didn't, have a, it didn't increase the price by $2,000, so it went up like four. Yeah, I know. The four Maybe the 30%. All right, you're right. The 24 yeah. isn't 30%. So the 30% doesn't include the handheld it includes um i see hold on i did this the other day so yeah, it might make sense in Let any case i think the 110 feels like a good number all right yeah yep yep julie and christina i i have a question on this if i could um the towns here, just on these three towns, Andover, Arlington, and Waltham, do we know um, they're using, I gather, uh, the kiosks now, is that correct? Andover, Arlington, and Waltham are using kiosks now? That's correct. Could, before this, were they using a parking system? where you had to pay for a parking meter and then they left the parking meter system and went to a kiosk, is that correct? Some of them, yeah. So um, our, uh, Andover, had, Andover had meters and switched to kiosks. I think that's what they said. And um, let me just scroll up. Uh -huh. I think they said they still have meters on the street. Or maybe I'm wrong. Okay. And they all, and list. they do have an employee pass program as well. So they they do give out employee passes too. Um, they definitely had meters because I remember paying them back I, in the day. Yeah, I could be wrong, but Andrew, I thought they said they had both, but maybe I'm wrong. Waltham had different kiosks originally. Now they have new kiosks, so they had and I'm trying to think. I think their on street is not is uh is free. Um, so the, it's just in the lots that they have kiosks and they've had them since the eighties. Um, that, although it seems odd that that would be the case. So maybe it was meters, um, in the lots. They, they had meters. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and then Arlington prior to 2016, I don't think had paid parking. Okay. So if I, I'm trying to understand this, we're going, they went from a parking meter situation to a kiosk. And we're gonna go from a, a non, a, a parking situation with no revenue to the kiosk. Yeah, 
because they 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 were used as was mentioned here earlier their mentality was they were used to uh paying for parking these towns seem to be uh mentally adjusted to to coming downtown to get a spot downtown they'd have to pay for the use of that spot um i think the two lots that we're paying for are we're going to put the kiosk in we're thinking of it uh these are lots and someone can correct me if i'm wrong but i i thought they're lots that people are used to coming down and um uh, parking and um not having to pay for it. Correct. They they don't pay now. Nobody in Reading pays um, besides those employee passes. But we were trying to have paid parking to incentivize um, the turnover in the lot. So you can still park on the street for two hours wherever there's an open space. And if you want longer or closer, you can pay a little more in the lot. Well, that, that was staff, and I think most people here was why they were doing this, too. So I think we can recommend the, the 110 thing and then work out the, the kinks on the pricing, how much it's free, et cetera. But no matter what, it seems as if that's the direction we're going with the meters, and we can hash out this other stuff afterwards, it looks like. But I mean, I think if we're proposing something, we have to propose something. And I think we're going to go to a public forum in a couple of weeks. Is it next week or a public? It's next, next week. week. Next, next week, week, we're going to go and we're going to have to, and people are going to say, you're going to put paid parking. Well, how much are you going to pay? Well, we have to have an answer. I'll this is what we said a long time ago. We have to, we have to either recommend an hour free or something. I mean, I, th I do think we have to make a decision on that. A, a recommendation. Yeah. It's not our decision. It's a recommendation. My opinion is the first hour minimum should be free and then I'm okay with a dollar after that or something. Most people are gonna park for under four hours and that's like, at, doing that math, that's $3 because you got the first free. Well, you I, don't I, park there and you park somewhere else. Yeah. Is everybody okay on the hour free? And then we can- Yeah, I like the hour. Yep. Tom, Tom, you had you had some. Uh, I sense that you had some reservations about the the concept of adding paid parking. Is that is that a correct perception, or do you want to have any other comments on that or qualifications? Well, the only only comment. Thank you, Brian. The only comment I have, I, I, having looked at Andover, in, uh, Plymouth, and Marshfield, and Fall River, and some of these other towns, they seem to have a lot more spots that are generating revenue. Uh, uh, I'm not sure for the investment. I haven't been fully convinced for the investment uh, um, of getting a kiosk, going right to kiosk, uh, that our return on investment, particularly from what I've seen from the three that uh, uh, proposals that uh, have been put uh, forward, I, I, I really haven't been impressed with their financial proposals uh, uh, for us. Um, that's just my, my personal opinion, but I, I, I don't know, uh, maybe we should be prepared. There might be some other people that feel the same way at town, uh, meeting and be prepared to defend, uh, uh, our position if we're going to try to put kiosks uh, in, but, uh, you're correct, Bernie. I, I not, um, I'm not fully on board for the kiosk because we're going to get the um, person that we've talked about uh, for a while now that we, they've opened up and they've had interviews in um, uh, to try and uh, move the traffic along, which was the purpose uh, of this uh, committee to try and in these two lots, try to create some open space uh, during the daytime for people to uh, use those lots efficiently. And one, one of the questions I asked earlier, and it could still be a, an option would be to, if Christine could try to collect more data on the um, actual utilization of these two lots now that the enforcement is taking place, right? So we could always give town meeting or town um, the, the, the select board that says a majority of the people on the park 
believe that using kiosks are will create turnover. However, um, the town police department can, you know, give a report that somehow suggests or monitors what the actual utilization and abuse of the spaces is. And then at some point, mm -hmm. if there is no, if there is no problem, then we don't have to pull the trigger on spending the money. But if there is a problem, then town meeting has the authority to uh, to spend this 110,000 to go forward and put them in. And at least, um, you know, that's a that's an alternative. It's a compromise to satisfy your your concerns. Uh, those would be my concerns as well. But I don't know if I think it, most of the other people were we're sounding so in favor. We definitely had a problem from at least 2015 to 19 with yeah. having a full time enforcement officer and no spaces once those brandy court um, businesses started. So it's hard to judge it off of a COVID year again, but we definitely yeah. did have the problem before. I mean, we'll get, we'll take a look at you anyways, but I, I really like to go to hope that it comes back at pop, but in, in 2018 and 19, it was very bad back there. And that was with. An enforcement person kind of yes. monitoring it all day long and yep. giving out tickets and so on and so forth. Yep. So yeah. But I also think that during that time, Christine, um, we were going through an expansion downtown where we were having some construction, and I think we had a lot more people uh, fighting for those parking spots than um, we do now. That the uh, the uh, the the Places have been complete that have, that have been uh, constructed downtown, but uh, I could be wrong. But I think if we see other cities and towns on that list coming up with committees on how to spend the money, I think we're going to get the money back. It might not be as fast as Andover that has like 38 kiosks or whatever number was on there. I just think if if they're doing this and coming up with that, then we're going to get it back and in 110 grand seems as if that's paid back in a year if if, if it's a dollar it, that's just it's just my opinion they wouldn't be creating these committees on how to spend the money if they weren't actually making money from this julie had a great spreadsheet that showed us exactly how the time frame for us to making it back and it was very detailed on how many people used it per day how many hours etc so the investment is a temporary investment. We can prevent it, recoup the money in probably a year based on some of the data that she had, whether it be Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. So I feel like it's a little frustrating because I feel like we're going backwards instead of forwards. So I feel like we decided we're going to do kiosks weeks and weeks and weeks ago. And, and now I feel as if there's some discussion about backing up from it. So if we're supposed to have a forum next week, mm -hmm. we present to people both ways. We either have to come to a conclusion on it or we haven't done our job. Yeah, and I think just Karen, I, again, I would, I would uh, strongly urge you to look at that spreadsheet. There are very, there are assumptions that will not be true. I'm not suggesting that we won't have revenue from the kiosks, but the amount of revenues in that spreadsheet is very, very misleading and inaccurate. I read the spreadsheets and I, I completely agree with her analysis because it was a very conservative analysis. It wasn't conservative because it, it did not include any utilization because most of our survey uh, and most of the practice of people using it turn over between, uh, you know, they, they X percent use 30 percent, use 30 minutes. Uh, another percent uses one hour most of the people are out of there in two hours, right? You're right. So but none of that, none of that, none of that utilization was applied in that spreadsheet. And all I'm saying is that you must use that utilization rate. And when you do, you're not going to get those numbers. You're just not. Uh, the survey that we did was for 750 people that responded. Is that about even if it was a thousand people? If there's 25 yes. people that live in yes. the town of Reading, that didn't incorporate many, many people that live in Reading and go downtown. So I think you know, a lot of people, once they see that kiosk there, they're not going to park there. So the, you know, you're going to get, I don't disagree that there will be money. I just disagree that the utilization factor was not incorporated in that analysis. And therefore it overestimates the amount of revenue. So let me just clarify. I, first of all, I did not 
make this analysis. This came from Nelson Nygaard. And the reason they didn't include the hour free was because that was not what they were recommending. That was not what staff were recommending. Um, we were always recommending no more than a half an hour free. Um, it, you know, you might be right, Bernie, that if everyone just comes for an hour and, then, and no one pays, then we don't make this kind of money, right? And maybe it takes three years to pay back the kiosks or five years, right? But, but I do think that like, some of the survey response directly relates to how long we let people stay right now, right? So people aren't coming for three or four hours because where are they gonna park for three or four hours? If we have, a, we have designated places where people can pay to stay longer, they very well might do that. So I'm just throwing that out there. Well, yeah. I, I agree with you, Julie, because I think some people have the perception that there's no parking downtown, just like me, that, aren't coming anyway because of that. So we we are we are massively underutilizing the downtown because people aren't coming because there's no parking to begin with. But if we open it up and say there's tons of parking downtown, it, the numbers that we have are going to go up. Now, if they stay for an hour, it is what it is. And if it takes three to five years mm -hmm. to pay the stuff back, we're still getting the money back eventually. As long as we don't have a guy from New York coming every day for a thousand bucks. And you know have and you have to you know you have to build those kinds of costs in there. Yeah. So, How so, sold in sold is everyone on giving a free hour? Like is that and I apologize I, if everyone talked about this ad nauseum. I mean I actually was always I was always good with the half hour, but I'm also flexible to the hour just because I know there's a, gonna be a huge socialization problem with this concept initially. Correct. I think I think going out of the gate with a free hour is reasonable, and then maybe a year from now we evaluate should it be a half an hour? I don't know. I agree. I think we're not we're not making this is never about making the money. It's about moving the people and making everyone happy. And I think an hour for some uh, some people going into CVS or if I went to Venetian Moon to have dinner, I paid for two hours. I just paid a dollar because I got the first hour free. I mean. Who's going to say, I'm not going to Venetian Moon because I have to pay $1 for 30 seconds on an app? <laughs> or I, pay, I or would do pay. it all day long. Yeah. Or you park down the street for no cost. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, an hour free, I think, is a happy medium. 30 minutes, I think, is way too low. And an hour is enough where people aren't annoyed that Reading has an app. Like, I know it's going to be annoying. I know I wouldn't want to do it myself. And believe me, I would, I have 300 apps on my phone to begin with. It's just, I think an hour for me is, is very reasonable. It, it, it satisfies the 30 minute CVS person, and et cetera. So can anybody I ask, else comment I, on the hour? I just had a quick question. This has two sets of uh, hours, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Did we, have we chosen which one we're going to do already? Are we doing eight to six or? And I actually think it might might be 5.30 based on something Christine said earlier. Okay. Or, or Andrew pointed out earlier. Oh, I thought it was, I think everything's 8 to 5. Yeah, right or 5, now. 8 to you 5. That's change like, it, but it's 8 again, to 5 right now. There's another thing that's not in the spreadsheet, but it okay. you know, which will impact the revenue stream. But this spreadsheet is a starting point, giving some examples of what we might get based on different scenarios. So... Yeah, for some reason, the only spots that go past five o'clock are the 30 minute spots, they go till nine o'clock. And that's only about, you know, eight of them around town. So, but you can change it. But right now, everything is eight to five. Okay. Yeah, like if you went downtown to Nero or something to meet someone for coffee, you can still do the same thing. You're getting the hour for free and then moving on with your life. You know what I mean? You're not really changing that mindset. It's, I think it's good to start with the hour and then we can work backwards or forwards or whatever. It just seems, it seems reasonable. So, and then in speaking with Andover, they're going to price their lots based on what's closest. And they said it fills up. People will pay just to be closer. So I don't mm -hmm. think people will not come to writing because we put them. I think people like convenience. Mm -hmm. so I just have a question if these other towns are the kiosks all day long, or if our parking regulations currently stop at five, would we be charging for the kiosk slots after 5 p.m.? You know, I didn't Karen think so. That, Karen I, had that comment that for people who want to park overnight, would we allow them to do so? 
Well, that's not even up for discussion till after the P, the, the triple TF group meets. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't. Well, that, that, that can't, because there's an overnight parking ban on the streets. If we allowed people to park here overnight, the question is, how would you price that, and would you somehow have to change your regs from five o'clock to something? App that that it doesn't stop. I don't. I don't know. That's so my you, you simply. Was, oh, sorry. You you simply you know put in a no parking you know uh, between the hours of three and six a.m. Um, you know unless paid right and so right because no, that's who the only people that are going to pay. Um, I mean that are going to be parking there are people overnight and then you you get them to pay and. Then if they yeah. don't move their car by 6 a.m., then you ticket them, right? So after and, midnight. So let's say after yeah. midnight. So between 12 and 6 a.m. or something. Well, if there's a or whatever, of, right, pick the right. pick the time, but it doesn't even have to be by the hour. I think that we yeah. can program it to be a flat fee for the night, you know, two whatever right. it is. Just and if they're and and overnight parking, yeah. Right. And then they'll start paying by the hour when it kicks in in the morning, I imagine. Yeah. Um, Tom, can I, 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 I want to understand um, sort of what you were saying. And um, so, you, right, because you, you had um, asked about some of the other towns, how they went from, you know, nothing to kiosks um, or, or some paid parking to kiosks. Were you questioning the, Cost, I, I know you're questioning the cost of the kiosk, but were you suggesting that there was a middle step that some of them have taken that may be more acceptable, like um, like meters, or are you just I, were you just getting to the point about paying at all? I just didn't quite understand where you were sort of how your thinking was flowing there. Some of the towns uh, I've researched, uh, they look like uh, they went from free parking. The first thing they put in was the parking meters and then went to the kiosk afterwards. But the one thing they seem to have in common is the, the parking lots that I looked at. Granted, their bigger cities, Plymouth, Marshfield, Fall River were the ones I looked at. Uh, the parking lots they're looking at uh, uh, ones that have a uh, hundred spots or more uh, are, are bigger. I don't think um, we, we have that many spots to, um, to offer for um, to generate so, the revenue. So is a concern that they won't pay themselves that, that the investment won't pay itself back? or that it's not appropriate for a small lot? I, I, th I think the investment has already been said, it would probably pay itself back, It'd just take longer. I, you know, I, and it depends uh, how long you want to invest. Myself personally, I just, uh, I, I just don't uh, think kiosks at this time, I haven't been convinced that they're, uh, they're necessary. I appreciate the, uh, the question. What I, my solution would be, uh, uh, because it's been mentioned here, uh, there's going to be the lot that I can speak from as CVS uh, sometimes is busier more in the evening because of the uh, places we have downtown for uh, evening visits, which is Bunratty's and, and um, Venetian Moon and, and some others. Uh, I would be concerned to try and get uh, a long CVS there, another handicap, and maybe some 30-minute spots um, beyond 5 o'clock, because I think that's when you need the 30-minute the spots, when th those places uh, are very, very active. And you're looking for the uh, person that wants to run into CVS uh, to try and get that script or uh, someone else that might uh, want to take advantage of a, uh, a quick in and out. But I've looked at the, um, the handicap, one handicap spot is a very busy spot in the back of CVS. 
And uh, I know myself, um, we happen to own two spots on the other side of the CVS uh, railing and have allowed some um, elderly people uh, to park in there uh, to, to have quick access to uh, CVS. Understood, thank you. That is helpful to understand. I, I mean, I think I go back to John, uh, to Tom's point where I had mentioned outside the back door of CVS, there's that strip of like five or six spots right there making an additional one handicap and keeping the other ones 30 minutes to avoid anyone having to use a kiosk app at all, who's just running in, picking up a prescription or something like that. So I think that's doable. Anything beyond that, you're now going into other sections of the parking lot and it becomes just confusing. So I think if it's just like 30 minutes and then an additional handicap spot outside that door, I think that services the need of what Tom is gonna- Why, why, why do you need a 30 minute spot if everything's free for the first hour? I guess it depends on how we we enforce that. I don't I don't know if we got into it because you have to put your plate in kind of thing. And some people might not want to do it if they were just running in. But if you're doing it and you get it for free, I, I mean, that's a incentive to do it. But how do well, we enforce it? Well, we did we talk just, and we decided that the because the front of CVS is already free, that we were going to try and keep it simple and keep the back lot all kiosk and the front is all free. Yeah, no, I you mean, have I multiple 30 that. minutes spots in that front lot, right? Yes. And to Christine's point, those are 30 minute spots up until what is it, 9 p.m.? Right. And we don't have nighttime enforcement. Right now, our parking officer wouldn't be at night. So it would be very hard for Everybody any knows that. Officer. Yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> so it'd be very hard for any police officers. The more 30 minute spots you have, the harder it is for us. Okay. But from my point, what I see in the back there uh, after five o'clock um, in December, anyway, I found those restaurants, the, those spots that were not 30 minutes were, uh, were taken and used all evening, late until eight, nine o'clock or, or later, because they went to a restaurant. What I'm trying to do is offer the 30 minutes, or think about 30 minutes after, uh, uh, 5, 530, because that might be when you have that person that's running down to get into CVS to try and get that script, uh, please. So uh, you might find that the 30 minute spot might be better used after five o'clock when there's no enforcement and that person legitimately right now can go and park there uh, until for hours. Um, are you saying that it's your observation from from being there every day that the that the lot isn't being fully utilized during the during the diamond I again it's it could be a covid issue but are you saying that it's not fully fully occupied but after a certain hour there are there are very few if any spaces left because people are at restaurants is that what you're saying i, I have not seen that in january but during december for maybe obvious reasons the the christmas season uh, that, that lot was uh, very full with, uh, they had shopped the block dates. Uh, and then, and I don't begrudge the businesses, their uh, success of uh, hosting the parties and whatnot. Um, but Bernie, yes, I, I saw that the lot was seemed to be busier in the evening. Uh, once uh, it was brought to uh, the attention uh that we had a police officer um, going through and uh, giving some tickets uh, during the day. I haven't seen um, the, the problem that was existing where people were waiting and, and backing up, uh, looking for parking spots. So I guess to your Christi to Christine's point earlier, you know, I think what we might be experiencing today might not, um, you know, might not be consistent with what we're, we're likely to to be when people are out and about after COVID turns either endemic or is less of a concern. So I guess we have to plan on the fact that maybe this is going to get busier again. Mm -hmm. um, but again, notwithstanding your point about the construction vehicles kind of squeezing people into the lot when they could have parked on street. Um, but I think this is a fluid, it's a bit of, it sounds like it's a bit of a fluid situation. But I think we should probably I mean, I, I think that giving 
the PTTF, the select board and the town, the flexibility to implement these when, when they see fit. Um, you know, I think that that's, you know, that gives some optionality to not spending the money if they don't have to. That, that's all I was trying to make to your point earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose that's always the case, right? Uh, town, town is authorized to spend money all the time. They don't have to spend it. Sometimes they don't spend it. And in this case, we could just, you know, provide that as a, a qualification if it would satisfy members of the committee. So I guess, Christine, do you, will the new parking enforcement officer end at five o'clock every day so that it's pointless to discuss anything beyond five o'clock for enforcement? Pretty is much. Yeah. Right now, that's all we're budgeted for. Um, so if it is, if it ends at five, we're going to stop it at five. There's no sense in making this six o'clock. I mean, right. You could still have people pay and go off an honor system of their paying, yeah. but there would be no ticket writing. No, after five, yeah. really, unless we got another person. Yeah. Right now, the people in the 30 minute spots, if it's like in front of their store, they'll call us. An officer will go out and watch it, but we won't have time to do that for everything. Yeah. You know? Giving that optionality, Tom, does that satisfy your concern? I think uh, we should put the, uh, everything in front of, uh, we're only nine people here and uh, we should present to the uh, town and let them uh, decide which way they want to go. But, I, but I'm just expressing, and I appreciate the opportunity, my personal feelings, uh, uh, from what I've seen, um, I just don't feel, I just haven't been convinced that kiosks uh, are the answer. And I think uh, uh, on the earlier vote that was taken earlier for kiosks, I, I think I indicated my, my uh, position hasn't been convinced to change. I'm not saying I'm, I'm right and the rest of the committee is wrong. I'm just saying that um, voicing an opinion as I feel as a member of this committee, I appreciate being listened to, but uh, uh, maybe we should put it forward and, and let the uh, voice of the town uh, speak at town meeting to see how they feel about this subject. Ultimately, that'll, that'll be what happens, I think. Yeah, I mean, if they turn down the 100, 110 grand, I mean, I, where do we go from here? I, I don't even want to go down that road. I forget I even more, said that. No, so more enforcement, I guess. It's, yeah. It would just have to be enforcement. There are yeah. other options for funding, um, which you know we can explore in parallel to having a town meeting request, right? Because like Bernie pointed out, uh, you know funds get appropriated all the time at town meeting and and don't always get used, right? If some other source of funds comes up or or that things change or you know, so we can explore other options for funding kiosks. I wonder if ARPA can be used on any of this stuff. Probably not, but who knows? I mean, I think it could be that, you know, there could be a philosophical issue. I mean, we, in our survey, we had, you know, a fair number of people that were, had very strong emotional responses to anything about paid parking in town. So you, you could, it, I don't think it's a monetary thing. I think it's a, uh, it's a philosophical thing and it's a business risk. I mean, a lot of business owners here you all think that it's going to help your business if you have paid parking. And some people, you know, some people have said you're not going to use it. They might use it. They might just park for free on the street, which is fine. So it's just, a, it, you know, it remains an open question as to whether this is going to, you know, help or not. But so, yeah, I think we should just go ahead and, and either decide to vote for, you know, to, to appropriate this money for a town meeting, let them decide ultimately, and then there'll be a lot of discussion, I'm sure, at our meeting next week. And, um, you know, maybe nobody will show up like they didn't show up today, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think we can, anybody else have other, other opinions um, like Tom's or, or should we move ahead on this? I think we need to. I think we need to make the proposal and not be wishy-washy. I think that we're going back and forth and back and forth, and we can go back and forth and back and forth for months and months. And if we present to the forum next week or we present to the board that we're 
have all these ideas that we haven't made a consensus on, it's not gonna look like we did a very good job figuring it out. Yeah, so for, like I said, for me, I'm fine with kiosk, an hour for free and a buck an hour beyond that. And that's it, I mean, I, I'm I, good with that. I agree with you, I think that's right. I, but I think when we're presenting it, then, then we have to present it and, and, and shut the door and hear what they have to say and be prepared to explain why we came to that decision. But I think there's, there's, there's all of us and we're not all gonna agree on it, but the, the point was to get the loss to turn over. And this is the only way that we've discussed that should do that. And enforcement is great, but we don't know if the enforcement officer is gonna break a leg in a month and be out for six. You know what I mean? There's all different kinds of variables for all different kinds of things. And it's very successful in the towns around us. And I think we've done a lot of work on this. And I'm, 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 I think it's a great idea for the town, not, not necessarily for the money, but to, to do the purpose of what it was, what it was intended for. I agree that the uh, the kiosk coupled with all the refinement we've done on the regulations on each street and creating the additional employee parking to also get the employees out of those lots. I think the sum of all of these things together is the most effective solution based on what we were charged to solve. Um, and while I think all of us say, oh, you know, we, we have some, I think each and every one of us has some nuances of things we might change if it was just our own personal decision. Uh, Karen, I think you're right at this point, we need to say like, as a group, let's get our majority view. And then we need to just get behind that for our presentation, knowing that again, ultimately we're making a recommendation. We don't even have the power. We're just saying based on all the research and all the input we've gotten and all the reading we've done and all the discussions we've had, here is the big picture of what we think is the effective overall recommendation. And that's what we present to the forum next week. Sounds good to I can me. Get, I can get behind that. Yep. I was just going to say one thing, and, and to Tom's comment about how other towns and cities had gone from parking meters to the kiosk. Um, I think it might feel like we're leapfrogging, but I don't think any parking lots anymore, um, and Julie would know this, but put in parking meters. I think that that technology is sort of, you know, is no longer something you, you put in new. Isn't that right? Don't, don't they, be, because then you have to work around these parking meters. You gotta. It's manual labor. Yeah. That's there are towns that have done it like fairly recently, not like, you know, I don't know. I can think of a couple, but they're not great. There are a lot more maintenance management there. They break. I mean, there's one in Arlington that I park in every week. It's broken. It's been broken for like a year. I know I can park there and not pay for parking. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, they're, they're everywhere. They're broken. They're more maintenance. They, they clutter the visual environment. I don't know. I do. I think it's just a leapfrog, a technology leap, Tom. I think it's yeah. just that nobody would go to parking meters anymore. Um, as much as it, uh, Boston has parking meters everywhere. Um, so I think it's just a, you know, it's very different from, from town to town. I mean, the only they thing have. I would say as well is that I, 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 uh, I'm willing to go with a group, but I, I definitely philosophically think that, you know, there's uh, all the towns around us. I mean, you're talking about Arlington, Waltham, which are highly densely populated, very different towns. Andover's closer for sure, but Wakefield, uh, all the contiguous towns around us, I don't think any of them have paid parking. So. Know, paid parking. Where is it? Where is the paid parking? Don't they have paid parking? Where? I, I can't quote you the exact street. I think they might. They might. They might have paid parking in the, in the parking garage, but I don't know if the parking garage is uh, is operational right now. I don't know if there's something an issue there or not. I have, but I haven't been there in a few years, so I'm way out of date on that. I, I think the difference there and and Bernie is that. Um, most of those towns have considerably um, bigger parking pools, right? Bigger lots. They have more parking, um, I, right? I, I don't. I I do not see this 
um, well, uh, right, just like was said before, to me, this is a way to man to help manage the parking. Um, it's not about revenue. So if we had, if we had twice the amount of parking, um, then I would be right with you all free, you know, like there's no reason to, 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 to charge for parking, but, but this is the, probably the best way to manage it because, you know, enforcement, uh, is not the most, uh, effective and efficient way to do it. You still have to enforce the, the uh, kiosk though. Yeah. And they can be done very effectively. Yeah. But I mean, you're, you're still having to enforce. It's just a matter yeah, of how yeah. you enforce. you're using yeah. some tech, a little bit of technology and you're charging people money to help you enforce it. But yeah. otherwise you could always enforce it without having kiosks. No. And you're going to have to enforce it with kiosks anyway. So it's a bit of a circular argument. No, not at all. More labor. It's more labor intensive if you don't have the kiosk yeah. because then, you know, they're going to each and writing down a license plate. Who knows what yeah. they're doing? So. I, I, I don't disagree. Dan, anybody else? You haven't pined on this. Are you comfortable with where we are? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in favor of the kiosk. I think it will be a useful tool to help manage the parking. I, I, I think it's the, one of the best ideas that we have. So I'm for it. Okay, anybody else? Should we propose that $110,000 uh, be added to the town um, budget warrant? Any other comments on that? Do, I guess more of a question to, to Julie, do we need to do that? Or right, we're making a recommendation, we're gonna end up making a recommendation to the select board. Is it our, our purview to recommend money to? to uh, I, mean, I think I'm just going by the agenda item that that we have Julie put yeah. a put a vote on request to April 2022 time meeting to fund kiosks. So that's a good question, John. Um, I was asked by the town manager to have you guys vote on it, um, and I don't know if that's because of like the timing of yeah, town it's just and, because and, we have right no authority. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I I can't hurt for you guys to vote, and then whether it matters or not, it's figured out later. Um, so the the motion would be to recommend uh, to select board that they include um, one hundred and ten thousand um, dollars in the um, uh, in town meeting uh, budget or whatever the the budget is um, for uh, kiosks. Right, we're recommending. I guess my point is the motion has to be to recommend to the select board to um, to. Uh, add this money. Well, you could make it more vague, maybe, and say that you vote to support a request to April Town Meeting for funding in such and such and such an right. amount, right? And then whoever makes that request, however that happens. Uh, but yeah, the select board they're in charge of the warrant, and um, you know, I mean, do it either right. way you want. And I just wanted to say, if you can see the spreadsheet in front of you, I did figure out my uh, formula had an error in it. So the number, oh my god. <laughs> Control Z. It's because I have a second yeah. keyboard underneath my desk that I keep stepping on. <laughs> Gotta stop doing. So yeah, so this is the amount here. Um, so. Is anybody curious why she has a keyboard under her desk? I, I've not asked that question. It's I've a second keyboard. Myself, I'm using my I, laptop and I stash the second keyboard under my desk every time I'm at, at this computer. But somehow it connects to your laptop. It's still <laughs> attached. I know. It's it's a my whole system yet. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we've solved Julie's problem, so we can move on. So I think we can make a motion and recommend the select board ask for the funds. I mean, I any second? I will second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Aye. Aye. Any, op Aye. any opposed? Oh, right, opposed. No, no opposed. Tom, you're opposed. Opposed. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have any other items that we need to tackle? We're talking the preparation coordination for the public forum. I mean, what I'm thinking is that we we summarize all these things and use Andrew's spreadsheet and maps to um, highlight the difference, the, the existing regs changes, and where we 
where we expect, uh, where, where we're recommending. Um, we talked about the kiosks and the, uh, and the um, charges for the various permits and um, anything else that remains open. I would like to add, it's probably oh, yeah. from our prior, I don't know, when we did the, the rankings and all that, and it was like 6.3 or 5.4 about recommending a, a parking garage consultant or someone to just see if it's feasible to actually be done. To, that's essentially it. Not that we're getting one, just is it possible? Yeah. Actually, I did, um, I play handball with a buddy of mine that I've been playing with for, I don't know, 30 years or something and he's an he's an architect and they do quite a lot of work and I asked him about parking garage costs and so forth and I can't remember where I got the number but I thought it was like fifty thousand dollars of space and he said that sounded way high so there may be some opportunity there to look at it more carefully it but might I think be yeah, narrow because we can't get one because of fire trucks or yeah. or logistics so I mean it's gonna get put to bed but so it then have to, yeah, I mean, I guess 10 years we, from now isn't here saying the same thing. Yeah. I mean, there are other possible venues for, I mean, you could do it in town hall parking lot. You could do it. There, there are many other places that you could potentially do it. And that might be the, the ask that we explore a parking garage somewhere in town that would facilitate overnight parking and so on and so forth. Um, anybody have an objection to to that item. I have an objection to it. Which item? Building a garage? Feasibility right. study? Just a study. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I mean, I agree with Jay, uh, Jay's unspoken comment that, you know, another thing that we've been hearing from the town a lot is a focus on walkability, bikeability, shifting to a less car focused um, way of life. That being said, I also agree that in the complainingest town in the Northeast, if we don't have somebody officially say, this is not a great idea, we will never hear the end of it. So for that reason alone, it's worth probably looking into a feasibility study. I support it. I, I support it as well. And, and I had, um, sent you earlier today, Bernie, you know, you had asked for a couple of slides. I, I didn't get it done till today. Uh, but one of the other things that, you know, as I've been thinking about this, um, the other opportunity, which, which may, um, <laughs> may sit a little, little bit better with, with Jay, um, is one opportunity is, is for a parking garage at the train station. Um, and it, it would actually have double duty, um, to, to provide um, uh, high level platforms um, and improve accessibility at the, at the station. Um, and the, the reason why I was thinking about that is that, you know, it's much easier um, to get money to improve uh, transit and, um, and, you know, transportation multimodal facilities than it is for, uh, you know, a, a downtown parking garage by, by in and out of itself. Um, that parking garage could be used for transit, right, for commuter rail parking, um, and then free up some of the some of the spaces that um, that we currently sort of quote dedicate to parking, you know, manage for for parking for commuter rail parking, and then it, those could be managed um, uh, differently. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I don't know, just a, an idea, but after coming up with those, you know, those couple of different ideas, I, 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 um, like Bernie, um, you know, I, I think it had said is that, you know, there's a couple of different ways to look at this and, and each, each lot would, um, serve a different purpose. And it probably makes sense to just have someone look at the different opportunities and, um, you know, sort of the high level feasibility, um, and, and, um, and, either put it, put the idea to bed or, or, or figure out to move forward on it. I, I would also say, Bernie, there's, there's a dramatic difference in costs for, um, uh, private funding. So if you're, 
your friend is a private developer, um, yeah, 50,000 a space is, is way too much. Um, but for a publicly um, built, <laughs> unfortunately for a, for a publicly built um, uh, project, uh, you know, the costs are, are usually dramatically higher. Yeah. Yeah, I know he does quite a lot of stuff public and private, so I don't right. know what, but I can, I, yeah. I promised uh, myself that I would follow up with him, but it's just been, this is the craziest month yeah. of the year for us, but I'm so excited you sent me a email, John, but I can't find it. So you have to let me know. If it, okay. <laughs> you can get it. Um, well, it's just Bernie at ourfamily.net. If, if okay. But uh, any other comments on the proposal to add the study for a parking garage in our recommendations to PTTF. Do we need to vote or are we just putting it on the list? Um, put it on the list unless somebody objects to it or has a modification or whatever. Julie, is it um, possible for staff to kind of help us put that, um, the summary of these proposals together and uh, have them in some sort of a document that we can send out to everybody before next week's uh, meeting, or do you want some help on that? So um, I was actually gonna ask about, about that. And um, if the plan was still to distribute something more specific to everybody, we did send out a save the date um, and Karen um, went door to door with it downtown. And, and then we emailed it to like a whole bunch of different uh, email list that we have and the survey respondent list that you sent me, Bernie. Um, that was last week. And then, you know, typically we would do another round of outreach, like either at the end of this week or early next week um, to remind people. And that could be like more specific if that's what you want to do. And we can help with that. Um, I don't know if that would be something that like Karen and Andrew and I would coordinate, kind of like how we did the flyer. Um, or, you know, what's what's easiest for people. Could we also present our recommendations in an attachment to that announcement? I think that was the, the question that I was thinking about. Oh, like have it on the website or whatever and just like a link to yeah, it. Yeah, just so yeah. that, I mean, yep. instead of springing it on people at the meeting, if you give it to people before, yep. then they might, it would just make, in my opinion, the meeting more efficient. Yeah, um, no, that's true. Um, yeah, we can do that. We can help put put together the list um, and, and the documentation that you need. And, and we were also gonna offer to help put together the presentation for next Wednesday as well. And, and that we should probably talk about that tonight um, at some point, if not right now. Um, Shall we talk about it now? What would you like to propose? Jay has his hand up. Yeah, uh, yeah I just wanna go back really quickly to the um the study of for the parking lot and the what verbiage that we use i want to make sure that it's neutral and doesn't say that we are saying we want to study you know just because we want a parking garage something like that so yeah, i just, just feasibility to yeah just feasibility studies uh, i'm okay with i mean just something generic yeah as long as it's neutral. that's yeah okay that works yep just a feasibility study. Thank you. Yep. And and just to <laughs> belabor the point, right? Feasibility not of a specific site, not specifically of yeah. the CVS lot, but just the function of right the possibilities at different um, sites in town. And and if they find one that is promising, maybe you'll dive a little bit deeper. Um, but I, right, I think that. Right. There's a couple of different opportunities that that probably uh, are worth looking at and considering. Um, and that way, you know, the whole thing can either say yes, move forward or, or no. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really make sense. John, I don't know if it was you talked about earlier that there was a that somebody was. Um, the uh, postmark. 30 Haven, the, the, the continue. Yeah, the 30 Haven owns, right? It used to be owned by um, our, um, the bank. Uh, the better, you know, what that means. It's not on site, it's off site. It's a commercial lot. Can they pay to, can they pay 
that are right. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a big discussion. A yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Block it out. Your, yeah, your neighbor might remember more about it. Um, it uh, I, I was not that that was right before my time on the on the CPDC, so I, I don't remember all the details. Oh, yeah, so I guess the, but right now it sounds like a lot of people from Postmark are, are leasing spaces there anyway. So I guess my only I'm sorry to belabor the point, but I was just asking the, the reason I was asking the question was because I said, well, what if somebody decided they wanted to build a parking lot downtown? Why couldn't why wouldn't the town? Uh, look favorably upon that if a private uh, person wanted to do so. Is there any reason that we that wouldn't be part of the feasibility study, or um, or even the CPDC could say, look, we'll allow you to build this unit, except you've got to have, you know, park covered parking for the town. I mean, I know that's partly a crazy idea because it's how do you do that with a private space, but in exchange for certain um, things you could yeah. you could put that in as part of a requirement for a development. Um, Julie or Andrew, I, I mean, this is just purely going off my recollection, but I thought that there was something in zoning that sort of precluded um, uh, commercial um, uh, land for use as a, as commercial parking. Um, and it and it may be just downtown, or it may just be in my head that that exists in zoning. Um, but you know that might end up being an issue if that does that in, in fact exist. So my question or request is, um, and I guess I could look through it too. But um, you know that may be something that we want to visit if it if it is in zoning as a way that I recall it. I think you. Yeah. I, I think you're right, John. I was thinking when you were initially talking about it that it, it sounded like something like familiar, but it's a zoning restriction. As part of 40R, or just in no, in no, just just in general in our zoning bylaw. Really, I'd have to look like into it. So I guess the um, again the reason I'm asking is because we had a lot of comments in our survey. Why don't you build a parking lot? And I think if we get those comments next week, we should probably have an answer as to why. I mean, we can say that we're recommending a feasibility study to talk about it, but if it's prohibited in a zoning reg, I guess we should be able, we, we should disclose that as well. Or, or maybe it should be part of zoning. Maybe, zoning the, yeah, reform. yeah, maybe uh, there's a recommendation coming out of this that that should be this, you know, park. Um, the park committee that that should be changed with you know certain provisions of course for can't the town can't the town do a, whatever the want whatever it wants the town has to follow its own zoning or you can't override it you'd have to recommend it to the as a change to the zoning bylaws which is what part of what cptc was doing us last night right i mean if the and town could just override it chris what if they wanted to build a parking garage next to your house you just be like, oh, too bad. I mean, you know, it, it, it'd be kind of cool, I guess. You know, uh, <laughs> you'd finally live your dream of having. I would. Your own if, personal parking garage. Are they going to name it after me, though, Liz? If they do, I, I'm down for that. Yeah, um, it, and um, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong here, but right, the town doesn't have to follow zoning necessarily, but I, as a sort of a long-standing policy. Um, just for exactly the reason Liz uh, just laid out that um, that they uh, they generally do right um, go through site plan review um, all sorts of stuff because you know what's what's you know what we put we as a town put businesses through we as a town should go through ourselves um, and so we, you know we follow those so, same rules. Um, whether we have to or not. And the MBTA um, notably is the, does the same thing. They don't have to follow uh, uh, municipal uh, zoning, but they, they choose to because that's the right thing to do. And are we sure that, the, that 40R does not prohibit um, kind of parking facilities within that zone? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. That... Andrew's looking at, at the zoning right now. Um, okay. But I, one thing I might have missed the connection that was made, but just wanted to clarify like that lot behind Postmark, it wasn't a town proposal to have it be a commercial. Oh, right. 
Right. And it originally right. was a residential house that burned down. So the zoning, that was the big brouhaha. Mm -hmm. The fact that they didn't want to have commercial encroaching on residential. So that was the beginning of the sprawl and all that. So yeah. that was part of it. Yes, I think good if point. we um good point, Julie. That was not a town proposal, right? That uh, I, I hope I didn't infer that. Um, I think another if we're if we're answering the question at the discussion next week of we're you know, we're supporting a feasibility study, but one of the reasons we're not fussed about it is that part of what we have determined over this many months of analysis is we do not actually need a garage. I think that's an important thing to communicate that while that's a nice to have and over the long term, oh, more covered parking, this, that, and the other, that indeed we have determined there is sufficient parking. <laughs> People just have to be able to walk and that some of the parking management we're putting in place is so that we're trying to control who's going where to make it easier to use. So it's not just that, oh, fire trucks and regulations. It's also, yes, we'll look at it because over the long term, it might make sense but right now, there is not actually an inherent need for a parking garage. Except that we did have a long discussion earlier tonight that we have a bunch of people who don't have a place to park overnight and they don't have a place to park in the snow and we still need to find a solution for them. So We, we do not need to find a solution to a private problem. The town of Reading does not have to solve the problem for Postmark residents any more than they have to solve the problem for me if I buy my daughter a car and there's not room in my driveway. But you don't, but your, different... house is, but your house isn't in a 40 yard district where the town has authorized certain developments and made the mistake of not providing enough parking. It is no, your subjective an opinion that they didn't provide yeah, enough parking. It's in a different zone that had certain requirements. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think we've still got, we've still got, to, you know, lots of people have said, I mean, I, I guess I would respectfully disagree that that we don't have that overnight parking problem and that, you know, but. But that's not a garage problem. That's well, just, could a, be because it's, that's just it's, a parking it's, thing. That's just a spaces. It's not inherently a garage issue. I think that's why if we see how everything shakes out in the next year or two, but like this parking garage thing isn't coming up, like, you know, everything's gonna move so slowly. Like it's gonna be five years from now, but at least someone will know whether or not it can be done. And the perception, yeah that there's a parking issue downtown is preventing people from coming here as well and exacerbating this issue. I, in it's page 31 of the bylaws, Andrew, in case you're still looking, stuff about commercial parking facilities. Thank you. Yep. But yeah, Chris, thank you. I mean, that's, that's exactly it. It's like, we need to, part of what we were saying, like education is part of what we are proposing. And that is reminding people like, there is not, it is a perception problem rather than a, an actual availability problem much of the time. Yeah, so like we'll see how this all shakes out. Perhaps we fully solve the parking problem. There's no garage needed and, and everyone just goes on and everything's great or not. So. Even if there was a, um, uh, a need for a garage, would there be any space available to, to build one any, in five years from now? Everything's getting snapped up. I mean, it's not gonna be anything available. And if anything that's available, it'll be, it'll be a best use for something else. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dan. Um, what we have to do is bulldoze little, the towns and some of the restaurants or whatever you want to put in the parking garage because there's <laughs> no space for it, so. It's always Walgreens. <laughs> well, I can be convinced of that one. Yeah. Just trying to raise the taxes, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> So by the time this comes around, a, Walgreens will be up by then. I think Walgreens has already Walgreens has already moved. Yeah, right? the, the they're building over. itself. I think it's they're writing it off for a decade or something. I don't know. No, I think they're probably just keeping it so that there's not another drugstore that goes into it. <laughs> All right. So anyway, trying to uh, refine our plan for Wednesday. Right. Julie, what else do we need? Thanks. Um, yeah. So I guess I just wanted to. Um, I forget if Karen mentioned this in the meeting or just on the phone to me, but like there were some ideas about like how we might have structure the presentation. I think maybe they got discussed last time about having different people with different expertise take take a piece. And so it would be maybe more interesting for the people uh, watching and participating. 
um, and kind of break it out into into chunks. And, and I don't want to recommend anybody, but like, you know, maybe Bernie could talk about the survey. Liz can talk about the employee program. Uh, maybe Karen can talk about the resident situation. Um, John, talk about parking garages and note the feasibility study or whatever. Like, I don't want to leave anyone out or make anyone uncomfortable, but, you know, just kind of breaking it out like that. Um, and we're, Andrew and I are happy to help try to kind of put that, the, the outline of that presentation together um, for you. So, Julie, I'd be glad to talk about kiosks. <laughs> okay. I think he's being sarcastic. I know. I know. You think so, Chris? I, th I think, Tom, I can't see you right now, but I see sarcasm. <laughs> I, I think that's the case. And yet somehow Tom manages to be like the smiliest, friendliest he, sarcasm he's probably, that we possibly he, have. He's grinning ear from ear and he's, he's going to see me tomorrow and everything's going to be great. So. And then just figuring out the format and like the timing for each piece. And um, are you taking Q&A throughout? Are you going to have it per section? Are you going to hold it to the end? Um, you know, Andrew and I are, are here to help facilitate. There might be some other staff from town that would attend and, and potentially help facilitate as well. So um, just look, this, the, the kind of things that we should be thinking about for hosting a big public forum uh, in eight days. I mean, I think... I'm not going to be we're, here. We've certainly spent a lot of time talking about this stuff. I'm not sure that it's going to take as much time to just present the conclusions. I mean, it seems like we've got a relatively small, you know, task in terms of outlining what we've talked about. And I mean, we could we could drag it out, don't get me wrong, but I think in the interest of getting it out in front of people and just getting opening it up to discussion, assuming that we even have anybody that attends. Um, I think it'll just be, you know, it'll, it can be pretty concise. Maybe we just keep ourselves to 15, 20 minutes. So I, I don't know if what people think about how long it'll take a half an hour to get through it and then open it up for q and I think it's been, it's been advertised on Facebook, et cetera. I, I think we'll actually get quite a bit of people coming into this. I, I, I think... I, I would be surprised if it wasn't over 30 people again kind of scenario. Like, I really think that it, they're going to see, once someone sees the word kiosk or whatever, and that's it, like, they're showing up. And then that's where, like, other cities and towns, it's a half on steps, it's half hour, we're saying an hour. Like, you know, we're being very reasonable to everyone's needs and realizing that, you know. But I'm fine with what Julie said how she assigned everybody. I, I prefer not to speak on different municipal lots, et cetera. John do the garage thing, I'm, I'm good with it. And everything she said, Karen and, and Sarah have been very passionate about the residents and everything over there. I mean, they should definitely be doing that portion and, and Bernie and, and Liz obviously with the rest. So, I mean, I'm good. I think the format will be really helpful for when people start asking questions because if they're not gonna know who to ask the question to, so if someone asked a question specifically regarding the garage, John will know that he should be responding. And if Correct. Yep. A question about parking behind CVS, then Liz or Chris or Dan or Tom are, are, uh, are more open to be able to answer that question. But I think it has to be a really tight, very clear, very short speeches or presentations so that it's not full of a lot of excess stuff because we're going to lose their attention and we want to have their feedback um, to see if we're on the right track and to see what they have to say. I'm good with all that. Yeah, agreed, Karen. So Julie, if you're comfortable, if you and Andrew are comfortable putting together sort of that framework and tentatively assigning everybody as you suggested or however you think of it, and because you're allowed to distribute to all of us and then we as individuals, if we have any thoughts on how that should change, we can communicate back to you. Is that reasonable? Yep, that sounds good. Um, we, can, we can do that. Um, Are you going to be available? I'm on vacation next week. I didn't realize. Um, sorry. I'll be in Jackson Hole. We will miss you. We'll miss you. You miss all the fun stuff, Jay. I know. I, yeah. 
you can't got married and all this stuff like yeah <laughs> I think the other thing that's important to figure out in advance is like what, like we need to manage expectations about, about like time that people can take to discuss things with you and then what you're going to do with the feedback that you get. Right. So, and then like, what are the next steps? So we want to just outline that for people so they know um, that if they make a comment that y'all think is crazy, it's not going to end up being something you propose to the select board. Um, or if they make a comment that you're like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. We could probably tweak the system in such and such a way. Like, I, I, I'm i envisioning there might need to be like a follow-up meeting of you guys to kind of debrief like what you heard and whether any of the things you heard should change what you want to propose. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we could just, call, yeah, we could certainly call just, that if we, if we hear something next week that's dramatically different than what we've already heard or with respect to our proposals, if there's strong feelings, um, we can probably reconvene and have another meeting. However, however, in the meantime, probably just, uh, we have to get things down, done in the town meeting for the warrant for March 1st, and that's only a couple of weeks away. So you've, you've already, in my view, you've already made your action for the town meeting warrant. I think what you need to do is plan out your own schedule for the next couple months. You don't sunset until April 1st, just so that we can tell people what's coming. So they know other opportunities they might have to come to future meetings you're going to have and what you may or may not do with the feedback that you get. And like, you know, what just, I think it's important to manage expectations um, and be clear right up front about the rest of your process before you sunset. So, I mean, it, and with that in mind, I mean, I'm a planner, so sorry, but you know, your charge, you know, the description of park does also require that you have a meeting that, you know, some or all of the PTTTF members come to, to hear your recommendations and talk through them with you in a public setting. Um, and then also you need to figure out when to go to the select board. So, and the select board may very likely be more than one meeting. And if they take up any of your recommendations and decide to make any changes, there's a public hearing. So that's that's a process, right? So I just wanna just want, want you to start thinking ahead and, and we can try to talk about some dates. And um, I we have a PTTF meeting tomorrow morning and I wanted to bring them some ideas for dates that you might all be thinking of for a meeting that they could they could all come to. So it's, I know I just threw like a lot of things at you, but. So you, we need a meeting after the forum and then the meeting after that would be with the PTTTF. It could, be, it could potentially <laughs> just be the same meeting, right? But could the PTTF come to, to the meeting on February 2nd? Well, well I think we're presenting. That, I mean, that's more to get the public feedback. I think the PTTTF should have their own. But I, but I agree, I think we could combine our follow-up meeting with the, with the PTTF. Yeah. Right, yeah, I, I mean, I, we're gonna get anything done at the forum. I think we're just gonna give what we've discussed and hear back from people. I don't, we're not gonna accomplish anything. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think anything. we have to, if we get no feedback, <laughs> then I guess there are two <laughs> options, right? We get strong feedback that everything we've thought about or something that we thought about is is highly offensive to certain people. And then we get that feedback. And then we either decide to tweak it or incorporate their things into some revised recommendations. Then we formalize that and pass it on to PTTF. At that point, unless we wanna drag it out more, I don't know how we, what more we can do except for listening to the feedback next week. And, and if there's more feedback subsequent to that meeting through some venues, but I'm not sure that we're, are we, are we, are you trying to say that we should have more public forums, Julie? No, I'm just saying, um, like, I think what Karen said is accurate. Like, I think it's going to be hard for you to, it would be hard for me, maybe it won't be hard for you, but to take all the feedback you're getting and on the fly, like figure out how you want to make, if and how you want to make changes to things while well, you have a whole, let's just say lots of people come, you have a Zoom room full of people. So, you know, there will be not need to be another meeting where you talk about what you heard, and then that could probably be combined with your meeting with the PTTF. And um, 
and then you know after that it would be going to the select board so i'm not saying you need to drag this out for a bunch more months but i'm just saying plan out the next couple months before you sunset um and like the the date you want to go to select board like needs to be known so we can get on that agenda um you know and i don't know what other competing priorities there are on their agendas and in, in in march um or late february they don't have a late february meeting i don't think actually um so these are all things i have to take back to town hall and try to coordinate with everybody else in town hall, like you know the pttf and bob and so the sooner i can know what you're thinking yeah i mean i guess my sense would be we we have a recommend we have, we've already established a set of recommendations they're pretty well um formalized and and finished we take them out to the public we we send them out as soon as possible so that people have that information in hand before the second they come on the second to give us their feedback and there are two choices right we we either get negative feedback which we have to incorporate and, and put, potentially revise or we get feedback that it's good or we get no feedback in which case we simply forward the existing recommendations on and meet with the pttf or just send them a memo saying here's our recommendation and set up a time to present to the select board the only condition where we need to to do more work is if we get negative feedback on some of our proposals there is no question that we will get negative feedback because that is the nature of this town and we but don't know whether we choose to accept it or act on it as the is is a different thing yeah. right um and, and some of us right may hear things differently right some may have, have hear things as negative while others hear them as um agnostic so fair so enough we definitely, we, we definitely need to have that follow-up meeting just to confirm that um you know maybe maybe we do or maybe we don't he, you know want to change anything based on what we heard but we need i'll need to agree that yeah everything that was heard was did not raise to the level to change our recommendation yeah dan did you have something yeah i i don't i don't anticipate getting a whole lot of feedback only because most of the people that are probably going to be attending this has filled out the surveys given us a whole bunch of feedback to begin with. So pretty much we've been sorting that stuff out and we're making recommendations and pretty much they're gonna hear what our recommendations are. You might get a little bit of feedback, but I don't think well, you're getting a whole bunch. I, of I, I kind of disagree because I handed out close to 300 flyers over the last week. And a lot of those people are not on any of the lists from the survey and they live directly downtown. And I think a lot of people in town have been waiting for us to come up with something. So I think that there's going to be a lot of people there that have not touched us at all. So. I, I anticipate only tweaks to what we're doing. We're saying an hour, they want to have four hours or 30 minutes or the street by street <laughs> should be changed with this or that. I mean, maybe I'm just giving too much. Well, this is to just Julie's point, right? Just to, to it's 11 o'clock. I, I know Julie was in a meeting till 1.30 last night. So, um, uh, right, I, I think what I heard you say, Julie, was that, so, right, we have the meeting on the second, we need to schedule a follow-up meeting. Um, I, I, I do think, right, we, maybe, um, Julie, maybe you can um, work out a schedule with that that, that follow-up meeting is both us and with the PTTF. Um, and then we probably need to get on the select board meeting i i would hope right during that follow-up meeting that we're able to re revise i think we probably need to commit to revise whatever our recommendations are and then get on the select board meeting um agenda for the first you know for early um for early march in case there is a reason why it needs to go to a to a second meeting you know we need to revise or whatever come back so it right and so that gives us you know a, a two-week time frame to 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 get back and back to them before um before we sunset so does that uh, yeah that makes sense no. right so three meetings left from where we are right now um yeah. the forum earlier the, the forum the follow-up meeting and the select board 
Yeah, because the earlier you can put something to the select board, then the the more likely that it becomes on the agenda without it being full with other other things at the time. So, so the select board has a meeting on Tuesday, March 1st. Um, so if you want to target that one, I, I can, I, Bob told me that date, so I hope he has a placeholder, or he at least it's not getting too full. Um, he won't be town manager anymore at that point though. So agenda's probably not totally up to him, but um, we can target that date for the first select board meeting. Um, I'm not and, available that night. March 1st, you said? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I've got to, I've got to be uh, out at, this, uh, at the um, Celtics game that night with a client. Yeah, so. I mean, by that probably, point, all of us don't need to be there anyway, right? right? But the chair probably needs to be there. That's why we have so, a. Is there another yeah. meeting? <clears throat> is there another time that week? To the select uh, board meeting? I'm talking twice about their meeting on Tuesday, February 22nd as well. Um, it, so that just tightens your, your window. I mean, it's all right, you know. But then just between the 2nd and the 22nd, you need to figure out when to have a meeting to debrief and talk to PTTF. That's a lot. Um, that's a, yeah. I think that's aggressive. The issue with the March 1st, if you skip past that, that means the next meeting is the 15th of March, which, you know, now you're almost to April 1st. Right. Getting into I, mean, the I have no problem doing it the 22nd. I mean, we have the 2nd. Is second. it going to be... Oh wait, you're at the Celtics. I was gonna say it's it's gonna be a Zoom only, right, or something. So like, um, you're at the you can't do it from the Celtics game unless you're going uh you know, whatever. So, Chris, when does the select board have to uh, put on the warrant? First, it, March first. First, yeah. So I mean, does there any is there any reason that we have to make a recommendation to the select board before March first? No, <clears throat> no. Only if you want to allocate, ask them to put one hundred ten thousand into the warrant. Right? We already, we already voted on that. Yeah, so. that could. I think that could be a placeholder. There's things that are in the warrant all the time that get removed. We voted on it, but we have to let the selectmen know that we voted on it. Right. I will do that, or Chris can do it. But I'll, yeah, we don't I'll have to do that at a meeting. That can just be communicated. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring it up at the at the next meeting next week. So, so this During issue here, the, the issue here is whether, whether we think that we can get from this, from the second, from our forum, whatever issues get brought up, discuss them among ourselves, talk with the PTTF and be confident that through all that, we can then uh, um, end up with the recommendation that we want to give to the um uh, the select board by the 22nd. So 20 Actually, days. Actually, I feel okay about that if we can cram that PTTTF meeting in there. Right? Because there, there, that... be, there might be a I chance that we don't get a lot of feedback, like you said, and then well, it is what it is or it you, isn't. Right. Hopefully we don't. But um, I guess he, here's, my, here's my thought, Julie, is that uh, what if we shoot for the 22nd and we find after this, uh, after the second that we, you know, there's, too, there's going to be too much that we need to sort of go over, um, or the PTTF needs to, you know, give us some feedback or something before we finalize, um, it, could we then jump to the 15th? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can cue that up. All right. If that's, if that's what you think makes sense. Um. So what's the date in February for the second follow-up meeting with PTTF? I'm just not, uh, I'm not available <laughs> until after the 8th of February. And I don't know, did, Julie, does this have to go to FinCom at all because it involves the money or no? Like, No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, if it does, that was never, I, th I, I think I've done what I've been asked to do. Perfect. I well, plus for, for this group, we're just, we're here to recommend not to implement. So, yeah. Yep. All right. So a meeting with the PTTAF after the 8th and before and the, the 22nd. I'm sorry. I'm just looking at my calendar. Not the 11th. Well, that's a Friday. We should do it anyway. 
my mother's birthday is Valentine's Day. I don't think we want to be on Valentine's Day on the 15th. Julie, do you have any dates that are in there that because you have to clear it with them as well, right? Yeah, so I was hoping to just get a handful of dates that work for a majority of you, and then I can bring them to PTF tomorrow and see if I can try and, or uh, whatever. Yes. <laughs> a one to many or a many to many. Uh, make it work. I'm good the 9th, the 16th, and the 17th to throw three dates out. I'm fine with any of those. Anything before the 19th. 9th, 16th, and 17th are all good for me. Me too. So, Bernie, did you say the 15th or the 16th? One, six. One, oh, you said six, okay. Let me see. So those work for Bernie. So the 9th, the 16th, and the 17th work for Bernie, work for Liz. For March? No, February. No, February. Okay, was it 9th? Yep, 9th, 16, and 17. Okay. I'd rather not the 17th. That's really close to the 22nd. But it, maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. But any day works. Mm -hmm. We okay. might not get on the, the 22nd agenda to begin with. It's just you know, it depends. It's TBD. But the earlier, the better. Those dates work for me as well. Those dates work for me. Work for me. So that sounds unanimous. Yep. Here's hoping the peak and two. <laughs> so those work for Karen and Sarah and you, John. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Chris. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. So we just have to check with staff. Yep. I'm going to check with staff tomorrow, and uh, Super. see what works. And I'll I'll circle back as soon as I can and let you know. Um. Great. Anything else on our agenda? I think we have an other business holder. Um, we have. I I did want to go ahead. Just clarify. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, so in terms of like preparing for the forum, um, should Andrew and I coordinate with Karen? Should we coordinate with Bernie and Liz? Should we, um. You know, we circul circulate a PowerPoint draft, and then we'll, uh, we'll you know, have various attachments. And I'll try to. I, I want to look at the preparation of this, the final final survey, <clears throat> and for some reason, it didn't come to me with all the various tabs. So I act, asked for it to come back to me with tabs. But my intention would be to get that done, and then have it uploaded to the site so that people could maybe look at that before the February 2nd meeting as well. I thought I was gonna get that done by this weekend, but when I started working on it, it wasn't complete. <clears throat> okay. So PowerPoint with some attachments. Um, I don't know if you need, to, if you're gonna incorporate the Andrew, Andrew's uh, slides um, or the Excel okay. spreadsheet. Okay, we'll figure it out and we'll like the first order of business will be getting something on the website that we can link in a document that we can um, email blast and do the outreach. Um, town meeting members as well, maybe. I think that there was something that came out. Yeah. Town yeah. meeting members for this. Yeah, so. yeah it'll be the same. Okay, same blast, it away. blast away. Okay, and, and then we'll work on a presentation probably on Thursday. Else? I think our only other business is to profusely thank Julie and Andrew, who have been nothing but spectacular Agreed. and supportive and amazing in every possible way. Agreed. Thank Second you. that. That's nice. Thanks. You guys are pretty awesome yeah. being here until 1120. You guys deserve passing through it all. Better, if not more. So yeah. thank you. We can be here till 1130 if you like, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just. <laughs> Tom that should I annoy just, you, not impress you. <laughs> Tom and I can just talk about meetings. our love for Fat Larry's. I, I know, Chris, I'll meet you tomorrow for lunch. Yes, I'll be at the ribbon cut, cutting ceremony too. Oh, that's Thursday, right? Yep. Yeah. 
Any other business or should we, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyone yeah. opposed? Maybe. I don't think so. Good night, no opposed. Thanks so we're... much, Julie. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thanks all. All. Thank you. Night. 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 Night